Good morning. Thank you all for joining us here today on a happy Monday. A couple of weeks prior to Thanksgiving, and it seems like I just saw most of you just very recently. Uh, but always, always good to see our friends. But I would like to call the House Finance Committee uh, focus hearings to order for um, Monday, November 15th. And uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Representatives Campbell, Here. Camper, Crawford, Faison, Freeman, Here. Gant, Garrett, Gillespie, Hawk, Here. Hicks, Here. Lamar, Lamberth, Lynn, Miller, Ogles, Here. Sexton, Shaw, Here. Sparks, Here. Todd, Here. Whitson, Here. Williams, Here. Wendell, Here. Zachary, Here. Vice Chairman Vaughn, Chair Lady Hazelwood. Here. <laughs> Madam Chair Lady, you have a quorum. Thank you, and I'll let the record reflect that Representatives Crawford, Sexton, and Gillespie are excused. And um, thanks again for joining us today. I want to thank Commissioner Ely and his team. I know that there is a tremendous amount of work going on. Um, there always is this time of year with budget preparations and when we have all the additional funds and um, the additional questions about federal funding and what's coming when and how and where, I, I really appreciate them taking the, the time uh, to join us. And just for the record and for those who are watching, for uh, today and tomorrow, what we're going to focus on in these hearings are the federal dollars that have come into the state since we were last together as a body looking at budget. So um, doesn't mean that there aren't other questions that can be asked, but that is, that is really our focus in just trying to make sure that you members of the Finance Committee have at least something of a handle on the additional funding that has been allocated to Tennessee and how those funds have been spent or are being planned to be spent. So with that, um, Commissioner Ely, I would just ask you to, uh, to start us off and thank you again for joining us. Very good. Um, thank you, Chair Hazelwood, members, members of the committee. I've, I've finally been here enough to now know your seating arrangement. So when you start talking, I know, I know where you are before it took me a while to figure out where you were, where the question was coming from. But I um, really do appreciate this opportunity. There's a lot that's happened over the last uh, two years. And so, uh, as, as Chair Hazelwood said, this, this meeting today really is uh, in the meeting over the next two days, uh, as you meet with the departments, will be to learn more about the federal funding that uh, has, has been coming in and will come in. Um, so I'm glad to be here with you today to kind of kick that off. Um, to discuss the pandemic-related uh, funding. Um, my goal today is, is really to review uh, our, our processes at, at a high level and help uh, kind of inform uh, your discussions over the next couple of days, um, today and tomorrow. And then, uh, as Chair Lady said, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers and, as I get through this. Uh, this next, next slide um, shows a timeline summary. Who's got the clicker? I'll grab, I'll do it. Thank you. Um, so as you can, as you can see, uh, this, this really is the last two years. The red starts in January of 20, and it goes through this year, ending uh, in Q4 of this year. Um, and as you can see, um, a lot has happened over, <laughs> over the last two years. Uh, this kind of shows the milestones of what happened when, and uh, I know there's one thing that we're probably all in agreement with, and that is that nobody wants to relive uh, that time period at, at the beginning of this slide back in March and April of 2020. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm proud of the the quick action that um, this this body took and allowed us to take, as we laid out um, a, a both methodical and efficient process to distribute, as you know, what uh, has become a 
extraordinary influx of federal funds over a very short period of time. And so um, I hope that uh, we're all sleeping a little bit better than we were back in that um, time period back in early 2020. Um, but this, this slide is, is really um, a timeline of the, of the funding tables that, that you have before you um, and you'll be able to refer to um, during the course of the next couple of days. Um, I guess the, the overall message I'd be remiss uh, if, if I did not say uh, that I wanted to relay is gratitude to, to this body um, we, we have all been through challenging times and certainly, uh, this, this committee, this body, the, the group of, uh, individuals, uh, some of who are on this, uh, committee, um, in serving on the FSAG, the Financial Stimulus Accountability Group, uh, have, have really been, uh, a big reason that this has all worked, uh, effectively and efficiently. Um, working together, we have provided Tennesseans um, in a very short time period, uh, making sure that we took care of health at the same time, looking at, uh, at how we could uh, support livelihoods. And we now find ourselves in a much better position uh, than most, most states across this country. Uh, to aid in the providing of these funds, the legislature provided FNA really a unique uh, authority to be able to expand budgets very quickly and necessary to accept these federal funds and be able to dispense of these uh, federal funds on the, at the outset of this pandemic. At that time, of course, uh, the funds were coming in and we had to expend them in uh, less than a year and about eight months. We had to get them out the door. Um, and that collaboration worked very well in conjunction with FSAG. But now uh, we have returned to the normal expansion process. Um, it's important to us that uh, the legislature have uh, direct eyesight into uh, the wins and the purposes um, that these departments are expanding the budgets and expending those, these funds. And so that's, that's the purpose of what you'll be able to learn uh, over this next couple of days. This uh, next slide really is a reminder uh, that every dollar that's flowed to Tennessee, hold on a minute, I got the wrong slide. Here we go. Uh, this, this shows um, that every dollar that we've tracked uh, for, for public knowledge uh, from our team at FNA over the last two years to date, we've accounted for approximately $16 billion in pandemic-related relief that has, flown, that has uh, flowed into Tennessee. And it's really made up of three, three different buckets. Um, one bucket would be dollars that came uh, to Tennessee, to Tennesseans, really, uh, directly from the federal government and did not flow through the state. And they came direct. And, and a good example of that would be the Paycheck Protection Program that uh, all, of, all of you remember uh, hearing about, about back during the beginning of the pandemic. The second, uh, the second bucket is federal funds that, uh, that passed through the state to Tennesseans. Um, and the difference is, uh, in this case, in that bucket, is that those dollars were directed by the federal government for specific purposes. And so a good, uh, uh, a, a good example of that would be our LEAs that were receiving federal dollars. They would come to the state and went back, uh, back out uh, for education funding. And the third bucket um, that you, that did receive, I guess, a lot of attention uh, during this process over the last two years is funds um, that were provided to the state uh, for us, uh, along with FSAG, to distribute. And a good example of that would be um, the small business relief program that uh, received a lot of attention 
um, over the uh, beginning of CRF. And so, so those are kind of the three buckets that you'll be familiar with. Um, this is a quick visual of our process uh, that may help you in your discussions today and tomorrow. Um, just kind of shows the flow of the dollars and, and, and describes in a little, uh, in, a, in a chart way of, of how those funds are uh, dispensed. In most cases, federal funds are sent to the state, and the state really has um, no direct um, no direct discretion over those funds. They're going to a certain place uh, dictated by the federal government. But when the state does have discretion, such as the 2.3 that we expended uh, during the coronavirus relief fund, or the 3.725 that is part of the state fiscal recovery funds, which is part of ARP, the American Recovery Fund uh, re Rescue Plan. Um, the, the Financial Stimulus Accountability um, Group provides for the allocation of those funds. And so you'll see the two um, kind of different tracks that that goes down. Uh, I know all of you are familiar, but for those that may not be, I uh, just wanted to show the members of the Financial Stimulus Accountability Group. Um, we formed this group at the beginning of the process of receiving these funds after conversations the governor had with both of our speakers, and then uh, we expanded that again in April of 21, um, and very, very proud to have this dedicated group of, uh, of leaders who truly have the best interests of the state in mind and making sure that these funds are expend, expended very deliberately and efficiently. Um, other states actually have, have contacted us uh, over, over the last uh, year or so asking uh, how we were able to uh, take kind of a, a uh, members from both party, members from both houses, members from one of the state to the other and be able to formulate um, uh, a way of spending these funds. And uh, if I had to say, I mean, the short answer has been the collaboration of working uh, with that um, FSAG group and the feedback that they've received from, from many of you uh, in their respective chambers as we've gone about this process. Um, our, our process has been collaborative. Um, it's, it's been transparent. We have all the materials um, posted and archived on, on that site that we showed a few minutes ago. And I'm, I'm personally grateful for uh, the membership of this this body finance committee um, and the FSA group and uh, particularly Madam Chair you for serving on that and the time that you've put into that. So um, the great success of the coronavirus relief fund um, can be accessed on uh, this presentation that we've distributed previously. So um, that it, this is a this is a good place to go to remind ourselves of all the things that we did do through that uh, coronavirus relief fund. Uh, you know, that was part of the CARES Act that came out back in March of 20, in the early stages of the pandemic. And um, just, I, I, I'm just going to list a couple of uh, things or a few things that we did during that process, kind of the highlight um, big buckets but we did uh, not over 900 million, 932, I believe, into our unemployment trust fund to keep it where it needed to be to ensure that small businesses uh, did not have an increase in their un unemployment taxes uh, during that time period. And uh, that prevented uh, over, over a 300, uh, 300% increase if they would have incurred in their unemployment taxes. Uh, we had 300 million in small business relief, over 20 million in new higher education funding. As you recall, we did 61 million out of those funds. All of you helped us uh, double up, quadruple up last year in the budget uh, by putting an additional 400 million in broadband um, and then an additional 100 million in broadband adoption uh, that will be that is part of this current budget that we're in now. 
Um, we had 150 million in nonprofit relief. Uh, as you recall, 115 million that was put into local government relief and around 55 million in agriculture and forestry, 52 million in uh, hospital staffing assistance um, will be coming, uh, have already come to FSAG. We've approved some additional dollars uh, for that in this latest round of funding. And uh, we will approve today uh, in our FSAG meeting this afternoon, which is at three o'clock, by the way, if, uh, if y'all wanna tune into that or participate. Um, we'll be putting some additional dollars uh, into that staffing assistance uh, after hearing from the hospital association. And then 25 million last year in tourism as well. So you can see it's a well round, it was a well rounded program going into a lot of different areas. Um, and we did that in about six or seven months. Um, as, as you know, the federal government originally said that uh, all of that expenditure had to be done by December the 30th, 2020. And then they came back uh, three days before that and extended the deadline. Uh, as you know, um, I came for this group um, uh, in April of, of that year. And uh, is it April or June? I, I'm not sure. But I, re I remember y'all asking me uh, what would happen to these dollars that were not expended and were we gonna have to give any of them back? And uh, I, I think without thinking, I said, that's not an option um, because I didn't know what it was going to involve, but we put that program in place and um, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, we would have had every dollar expended by December the 30th um, and that we now have closed out that um, CRF fund and every dollar is allocated uh, and will uh, we'll, we'll be spent uh, now by December, uh, the end of this year, and we will not be sending a single dollar back to the federal government uh, as part of that. Now, uh, the Tennessee Resiliency Plan. So currently the FSAG is working to expand um, all of the, the American Rescue Plan dollars, which we are calling the Tennessee Resiliency Plan. Um, uh, we've been allocated $3.725 billion as part of the ARP funds. Um, the main difference between the CRF um, and the ARP funds is that we've got a much longer tail uh, on these ARP funds. These funds must be obligated between now, uh, 2021, and the end of 2024. Um, and they must be expended. We have two more years to actually expend all of those dollars. They must be all expended by 2026. And so, uh, as, as you can see, we've got um, much more time to, to kind of be deliberate um, but we, but we are obviously a lot of these will entail uh, construction projects um, like water and wastewater that are part of what uh, we've already moved forward with under uh, these funds. And so there's a there's, there's an actual construction period that'll go on uh, to be able to uh, expend these funds. And so uh, we've got to start continue to start moving quickly on this. Uh, we just wrapped up the public comment period uh, on the first phase of those funds that have gone through FSAG. I will say uh, uh, that we the public comment period was very good. How, how many responses did we have? 100. Over, over 100 uh, comments during that period. And so uh, we got a lot of good public comment. We've got our next meeting of FSAG, as I mentioned, at three o'clock today. Um, the graph the draft Tennessee Resiliency Plan uh, was published October the 6th, and it is uh, also available on the FSAG site. Um, I, would, I would say, you know, there are several principles um, that we look toward in prioritizing FSAG, uh, the priorities for a, a strong Tennessee recovery um, in, in fiscally 
expending these funds in a responsible manner. Uh, it provides for a consistent reference point for Treasury reporting, supports a quarterly reporting framework uh, where everybody knows um, where to go to, to see where funds have been expended. Also gives, as I mentioned, the public a place to review and comment if uh, they so desire. And it also provides a direction to local governments on how to maximize those local FRF funds. Under the ARP2, there uh, is enhanced reporting by Treasury as compared to CRF. So um, there's, there's, there's more stringent guidance as to uh, what these funds can be expended for and how they can be uh, expended. Basic requirements of reporting obligations, expenditures, contracts, grants, subawards, et cetera, will, will continue. State and local governments with populations greater than 250,000 must also now submit an annual recovery plan performance report uh, that informs Treasury, big, big Treasury, uh, as to how those dollars are being spent and uh, the, the performance as well. Key performance indicators are part of that process. Um, Mandatory, mandatory indicators um, as identified with Treasury are, are part of that process as well. And um, it requires us and uh, the departments as we expenditure those dollars uh, to ensure the project outcomes uh, that are achieved are effective, efficient, and equitable um, as part of that process. So, um, this obviously requires a much higher level of, of kind of administrative and fiscal uh, reporting uh, of which we have established a framework to be able to do that and make sure that we're doing that properly. So finally, um, just kind of bring us back to, to, to where we are. We have established a, a thorough and methodical process to be able to expend these funds. I know you're hearing from departments today and tomorrow, um, and uh, many of those have already accepted uh, through your expansions uh, significant levels of these federal funds. I believe the strong partnership with this committee um, combined with uh, the comptroller, we've been working very closely with the comptroller. He's been visiting cities and counties as well throughout the state. and. Uh, I call it the comptroller tour, but he's been uh, he's he's literally been going all over the state meeting uh, with with our our municipalities. Uh, this is this has been crucial in making sure that uh, uh, we get these programs uh, out if, if effectively and efficiently. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the process has worked so far. Our 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 management um, of our fiscal policy has worked so far. We are one of only a handful of states uh, that uh, was in the black uh, in 2020. We only had two months that, uh, that we had significant um, downturn in our collections. And I don't think it's happenstance. I, I think it is the combination and the result of years of good financial management um, by this body, um, by the legislature, and by the speakers, and we appreciate uh, being able to be a part of that. Um, so uh, with that, um, thank you for this opportunity to present. Uh, we'll take your questions. I, I may not be able to answer all your questions. Uh, I've got, a, uh, as you know, Dave Thurman uh, with me here, our budget director. Um, and, and a number of people from FNA as well as Tony Nick Najad um, that's uh, been very involved with the FSAG as well. And so uh, we should be able to hopefully answer your question, but if not, uh, we'll get you the answer. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we have questions. Uh, Chairman Williams, did you have uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner, for coming. I appreciate uh, you guys coming today and um, 
you have a full-time job prior to COVID. <laughs> this has uh, been a lot of additional work. Just want to say thanks for all the hard work you're doing. We did uh, get a spreadsheet as part of your package today. I just had a quick question on those. Are those where the monies are committed uh, or are those where the monies are allocated? For instance, is there a is there a, a similar spreadsheet or does this spreadsheet tell us what percentage of those funds are committed or no? So uh, this is really just a... Uh, Excuse our, me, if you would, just for the record, for our folks at home. Oh, David Thurman, Director of the Budget. Uh, so this is really just an inventory of all the, the programs, the federal buckets that have were funded in the, the, the last six coronavirus relief bills. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, each federal stream has, has a CFDA number, a federal, federal, uh, specific federal stream. And so a lot of the dollars that we received were really pouring dollars into already existing federal programs. And so that's what we're tracking. Each agency, state agency, is, serves as the point person to draw those funds down. And so we have worked with agencies to identify which buckets of funds that they've been awarded uh, and then help to understand at what point they've, you know, there was a long gap waiting for guidance on a lot of these dollars mm -hmm. and uh, understand what point they have guidance and, and when they start drawing those dollars in so that we can adjust their budget accordingly. So this is really just an inventory of that information. It doesn't necessarily mean, for instance, we, we may have a bucket full of money, but they may have not ex expended that that's dollars correct. out of this bucket, correct? That's correct. So hopefully this will serve as a good launching pad to talk with agencies about the timing and what they've done with the dollars. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ely. Let me add uh, Butch Ely with FNA. Uh, one thing real quickly I just wanted to clarify, though, is that it, it does include the other federal dollars through CRF that we talked about here, that bucket, that will that will flow through to FNA because it came through FNA and then it went out to the various relief programs, nonprofits or whatever. So that that's going to show up in the FNA bucket on this. And Commissioner, just a, a follow up on that. I believe that you said that the CRIF funds are will be expended by the end of this year. And so it's my understanding from some other conversations that we've had that um, this is truly an accounting nightmare <laughs> uh, with all of these dollars coming in. But we are tracking separately the CRF money, the ARP money, and are, I think, working diligently. And I think it's important for Tennesseans to know that that we're being very careful to spend the dollars that come in first and need to go out first to spend those um, and get those through our system prior to starting to draw down on additional dollars, um, you know, in certain categories. So that's correct. Yes. It, again, it's it's an accounting. Yeah. It's, well, it's a full employment <laughs> uh, opportunity for, for, for all accountants across the country. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Other questions, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for being here, and, and I thank you for what you do, because we can be no better than F&A, and you know, thank you folks do a good job. I do have one question, though, uh, about public comments you talked about. I'm not really for sure that I know exactly how that process works. Can you just kind of walk me through how what do you start with public comments? How do you communicate that out and what's the process? Yes, Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, sir, that's a good question. So we meet um, generally every month or so with the Financial Stimulus Accountability Group. And that's the members that, that I showed up there uh, a moment ago. And, and during those meetings, we present um, the consensus of the group to take the next step that, that that group is recommending to be able um, to utilize, you know, what were, were the CRF funds and now the ARP funds as we're getting into this next group of funding. So when we did that, uh, we then um, posted what the recommendations were, and we posted that on the FNA website. Right? Uh, is that right? Yeah, on the FNA website. So I, I think it may be helpful for us to. Uh, send that out to you so that you've got it readily available and know how to get to the website. But that uh, shows the, the comment mechanism so that the public has uh, eyes on that and they can send 
comments back to us um, so that we can take that into account. And then, like today, in, the, in our meeting today, we have the benefit and the members of FSAG have the benefit of those comments. And so when we, we take action today, then we'll have the ability of knowing uh, those public comments that came in during the last 30 days. President Shaw, you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, ma'am, I do. And with the chair's permission, I would like to get that information. I'd like to know a little more about and get a little more involved in how that's done. So thank you so very much. Yeah, thank we'll, you. we'll make sure you have access. Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Thank you and your team for being here as well. I was intrigued. You mentioned prior budget year, only two months of negative revenue uh, growth. All the other months were substantial revenue growth that we've seen, as well as what we're seeing so far in this fiscal budget year. I'm, I'm wondering about the potential effects of inflation uh, as we're seeing what's going on now at a national level, the price of gas, the price of everything at the grocery store. How is that going to affect existing budgets and budgets going forward? And, and I, I know many of us on the committee are, had pounded into our brains the recurring versus non-recurring nature of these funds and, and what we can expect in the future. Yeah. Well, of course, that's the uh, million-dollar question or billion-dollar question or uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> – uh, but it's a it's a very good point that you've raised, and I, I am uh, I think it is it is I'm very glad that we took you took uh, the actions that you uh, did during the last budget process. Uh, as you recall, um, we have two buckets, as you mentioned, recurring and non-recurring, and for the first time, I believe ever, uh, Director Thurman tells me, is we took the extraordinary measure of not spending all of the recurring funds. We used some of those recurring funds over in the non-recurring bucket in order to do, continue to do those things that were investments, um, and, but not spend all of those recurring dollars just in case as we came into 22, into this year, that we would be able to ensure that we had the recurring funds to do our recurring things and not have to go in the mid-year and start cutting departmental budgets. So that, that worked well. Um, it gave us a little bit of cushion as, we, as we've gotten into this year. Uh, the, the good news is um, the first few months of this 22 year um, are going very well. We again are over collecting from, uh, from what we budgeted because we were cautious. And we fully, we fully expect uh, 22 to be um, a, a, a good year of growth um, for uh, our state. And so looking out beyond, and we'll, we have funding board meetings next week or yeah, this, this week, um, looking out beyond to the out years, um, we, we still feel caution is is worthy um, because uh, much of the spending, much of the over collections that we've had over this last year or so, um, we have no guarantee is going to re repeat. And so I think um, it, it would be a good measure uh, for all of us to continue to be aware of that and cautious of that as we look to this coming budget. Um, I would just like to say amen to that, Commissioner. Um, as you know, and everybody, I'm, I'm really I'm cheap, and I tend to look at the glasses half empty on the financial side, and it really is concerning uh, with the inflationary pressures. And you know, I just think that we have to uh, continue to be very cautious about what we consider recurring um, dollars for our budget because. Um, Sooner or later, this cash flow, I keep saying that, um, but at some point, then there is the piper is going to have to be paid. And um, so I appreciate the fact that your department continues to be very cautious. And I want to urge this committee, um, as we start to look at next year's budget with you guys, to, to remember that and to do the same. 
You had mentioned um, in your comments about the reporting requirements were more stringent um, on these ARP funds than the original CARES dollars. And for even local governments with more than 250,000 population, they have some very, um, I guess, prescriptive mm -hmm. requirements for um, those reports. Can you tell us we already have talked about the accounting nightmare uh, in keeping up with all these dollars. So what has that done to personnel requirements in your department and other departments as just the tracking of the dollars and then for our local governments as well? Yeah. Well, it has been a, uh, I'm not, I, would, I wouldn't say nightmare because it's turned out, <laughs> it's, it's actually working really well, but you, you made the comment earlier about it's, it's really a whole nother set of work that has to be done because all, of, all this has to be tracked separately and independently from, from what we're doing uh, through our normal budget. Um, so it, is, it has been, uh, our team at FNA has done a tremendous job of setting up uh, the, the format um, to be able to track these dollars, uh, but Rather than duplicating a whole another uh, hiring of, of a, a whole team of accountants internally in-house with F&A to do that, we have, have contracted out um, with an accounting firm, a national accounting form, firm uh, that actually cut their teeth on Katrina uh, during that time period of making sure that those funds were tracked properly during Katrina through FEMA um, because uh, there were many strings attached during that process as well. And so this, this firm specializes in making sure, um, number one, from a legal standpoint, they've got attorneys on staff, um, and they work with us and they work with our departments in ensuring that the, the programs that we are recommending meet the eligibility first. So they, they do a review to make sure that they are in compliance. And then once the funds start flowing, then our, our team gets more involved in making sure that um, working with them that every dollar is accounted for. And so uh, it is, it has been, it's been a huge lift um, and, and one which we would have either had to hire a bunch of additional people and then lay them off in hopefully a year uh, or, or two um, or a few years. Um, or we could do it through hiring a professional team that is doing this, uh, has been doing this in other places, and that we could lean on to make sure that we were doing things properly. So that's, that's what we chose to do. And I believe that those, that same group is available uh, through the comptroller's office to help local governments when they have yeah. questions about Sorry. that as well, which is, yeah, is that, critical that. for our members as we go back and, and deal with the folks back home. It's really important that these dollars are expended the way that they're um, supposed to be. And so I would just encourage all of us to encourage our local governments to utilize that process through the comptroller's office. Yeah, let me let me add to that. Uh, I forgot that part of the question. So uh, we have, uh, I think, taken great strides in making sure that our, our local governments, local governments are getting over and above what I just talked about with the 3.725 coming to the state, an additional 2.2 billion that our, our counties and cities will be getting uh, also. And so what we are, are, are wanting to do is to be a resource uh, to our, our cities and counties. And so we're, we're making available to them the resources uh, at, our, at the state's cost to be able to have uh, these professionals to be able to help them in making sure that uh, the programs that they set up or the, the plans that they have to expend these funds are done properly. In, in addition to the firm that uh, has been helping with the overall. Uh, we, we recognized that uh, we didn't want to put all of our eggs in one basket and make sure that we were able to help um, what may be a, a myriad of questions at the same time to cities and counties um, because we've got several hundred entities that'll be receiving these funds. 
And so we're going through the process now um, of, of uh, going through a procurement process, working with CPO, going through a competitive process so that we can pick a handful, I don't know if it'll be four or it'll be a half a dozen or so consultants that also do the same type of work that we'll have on an on-call basis to be able to, um, to, to, to have that resource available to our cities and counties where they can pick, pick up the phone and contact one of these uh, firms that has already been approved, already gone through a competitive process to be able to utilize them to help get answers. And so uh, that should roll out by, Janu by December, okay. January. Late December, early January. Late December, early January. So uh, that'll help us uh, help them. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Zachary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, good morning. Thank you for uh, taking the time to come and talk to us this morning. Just a quick question, somewhat related to uh, Chairman Hazelwood, Chair Lady Hazelwood's question. Um, anytime we receive funds for the federal government, there's always some kind of guidance or strings attached to that. Uh, back a couple of months ago, the uh, Department of Education sent out a, a very detailed form to our LEA asking for really specific, specific information all the way down to seating charts, how we were contacting for contact tracing. It was extremely detailed. And when I began to dig into that a little bit, they told us it was related to the requirements from the federal government for the ARP or the CARE funds. So my concern has been as we walk through this, what kind of strings and additional guidance and requirement are gonna be required of us as, mm -hmm. as Tennessee on Tennesseans mm -hmm. that really would violate the spirit of the conservative government approach that we have in Tennessee. So my question is, do we know that guidance and those strings up front or do they have the flexibility to do that on the back end after we already take that money? And then kind of what steps are you guys taking to watch and ensure that, all right, that string, that guidance is a step too far. We're not going to be able to accept those funds because of that. Good, good question. Uh, let, me, let me make a comment and then I'll, I'll let Tony add to it. He's been more involved in dealing with the federal government on the on the requirements um, and, and on the guidance that has been coming out. But I would say that uh, generally we do know, um, we, we do know the strings attached and most of the strings attached are related to um, making sure the funds are spent where they're supposed to go um, under the, on the programs that are uh, laid out as as Dave uh, pointed out earlier, uh, the the vast amount of these dollars are really being funded through other existing programs that are already out there, and so um, our departments and our agencies already are familiar with those those programs. They're just additional dollars that they have available to spend. So for the most part, I would say. Um, that these guidelines are familiar um, and, and we know them up front before uh, taking the dollars and it's just a matter of making sure that we um, expend those dollars in, in, the, in the fashion that they were supposed to be. Um, why don't you talk a little about the, uh, the original guidance that, and, and, the, and the, the last guidance um, so that they're aware of that. Yes, and I'll speak. I'll speak generally, and then Tony for the, for oh, the record. I, I'm sorry, Tony <laughs> Najad, Policy Director, Governor's Office. And see, I called you Tony instead of Mr. <laughs> Nikajad because I'm always afraid I'm going to butcher that name. So uh, <laughs> well, you thank got it right you. that time. <laughs> um, uh, Representative Zachary, I'll speak generally about the process and then maybe respond a little bit to that specific situation with the background that I have. But I'll, I'll leave. Uh, kind of what I don't know uh, for the Department of Education to fill in some of the gaps. But generally, when these new programs are created, they are passed by Congress. They are created with, with maybe a page, two pages, three pages of uh, information describing the criteria or the, the general purposes that they want to see these funds used for. And then eight, the federal agencies then craft rules and rulemaking that um, seek to implement that 
at times that rulemaking, it, it does seem a little challenging to see the connection between the actual rule and the statute, and there's a fair amount of judgment that is applied by that agency. What we do whenever one of these new grants come in, we take great care to review those guidelines in, in, in detail, and we identify areas that may be of a significant challenge to us, and we correspond with the Attorney General's office to, to talk about a strategy to address that. The best and most recent example, um, uh, the most salient example that I would raise is around the American Rescue Plan funds uh, passed in March. The 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 $3.725 billion that's coming to the state of Tennessee over the next five years, out of that grant award, which is administered by Treasury, um, Treasury drafted into the regulation based on one line in the statute that states may not reduce taxes or ta take any action to reduce tax collections uh, as a condition of taking these funds. And so you may recall back in 2011, 2012, there was a fair amount of litigation around um, a similar conditions around Medicaid expansion, right? There were states that were told if you did not expand Medicaid, you would then lose X amount of dollars. And so um, in correspondence with the Attorney General's office, we determined that that was something that we would not feel comfortable signing on to as a as, and in fact, it is something that should probably be the subject of litigation. Um, we have, uh, working with them, uh, developed a uh, case that against the federal government, against the tre uh, U.S. Department of Treasury seeking to enjoin that, and just last month, the Attorney General won a preliminary injunction in joining um, Treasury from enforcing that provision against the state of Tennessee. We also, in our award uh, application where we where we submit to draw down those funds included a reservation of rights stating that we are in no way conceding that that is a valid use of Congress's um, spending clause. So we, we work to protect those types of um, rights and, and, and sovereignty of the state of Tennessee in, in implementing any of these programs. Um, however, we can acknowledge that in some of the, for each ag agency and each administration, there's going to be very different approaches, and, and we do have to kind of be vigilant at various types of attempts to try to squeeze in a little more control as a result of these, these awards. So um, it is something we're very concerned about. As for that specific circumstance, um, I would uh, refer you to the Department of Education to answer those questions. Um, the ESSER fund, uh, which was passed through the state to local education agencies, approximately to date a little over $5 billion. Um, that uh, was a fund that the state had no uh, discretion in how to administer it. It was a formula predetermined by the federal government and we either sent it or um, they would send it for us um, to those LEAs. And I can imagine there are certain conditions as of taking those funds that you must report on certain uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, IDEA, other types of uh, provisions of federal federal government. And I imagine that audit or that pre-audit inquiry is related to compliance with those. Chairman Zachary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tony, for the explanation. That was fantastic. Uh, just one final question. So the guidance requirement strings, whatever we call it, do they do we have to know those up front before we take the money or can that be amended or changed on the back end once we already accept the money so uh, I'm not a uh, federal administrative law expert so I couldn't tell you what the process would be if they were to change it but my understanding and in the grants that we have worked with um, there is an agreement when those funds are drawn down and as long as those are the terms, those are the terms. And so actions that we take now under terms set out uh, by that agency, um, that is the agreement. If they were to later come, come and say, you know, we've changed our mind, we've done reasoned deliberation, and we believe that the standard should be X instead of Y, um, that would, may apply to actions going forward, but could not be applied retroactively to actions taken before. Chairman Wendell. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ely, could you provide us with the gross amount of federal dollars the state of Tennessee has received since February of 2020? And I don't expect you to use generally accepted accounting principles to give me the exact number, but could you give me a gross number of how much infusion of federal money 
that the state's received since the uh, beginning of February 2020? And that's the 16 billion number that if you're we've talked about. That's, that's David Thurman, uh, Director of the Budget. So it's going to be, uh, I have to give you a range because I think. That's fair. Yeah, so I think what we're showing here on this report are the dollars that, that have been awarded to us through the different funding. And so we have adjusted agencies' budgets for the most part to recognize these dollars so they can draw it down. But it's a timing issue, and it's uh, experience. So it may not all happen in a fiscal year, but it is uh, north of uh, of 16. So uh, you know, I think the uh, the budget that we just brought forward to you last year was a. It showed the budget had grown eight billion dollars. Eight, uh, $8 billion dollars. So uh, for FY, I think it was tw one. Yeah, 21. So I think. Maybe 21 was 8 billion that we recognized, but did they spend it all? I don't know yet until we finally close the books, but it, it's somewhere, it's spread over multiple fiscal years, so it's hard to tell you a number with a fiscal year. Is that inclusive of the 3.7 billion one-time payment that came in sometime mid-summer of this year? Right. Uh, that is, all of those funds have not been received, so the way the 3.75 is, is being, um, delivered is they've given us the first half payment and we are now in the process of of working with FSAG to determine how those all those dollars will be spent a year from now we'll receive the other uh, the other tranche of dollars um, so in general it would not include all the 3.75 because those have not been so we're, we're edging to 20 billion or close to 20 billion if we include we, we that in the basket. Be, yeah, we and will be at the end of this. Just one follow-up question. I'll I'll stop. My calculations, and I may be wrong, but my calculations will receive approximately 40 to 60 billion dollars from the transportation department, the federal government, to our highway department, or highway department, DOT. Are those numbers, is that high, low, or what, what do you anticipate that we'll receive as far as part of the Infrastructure Act uh, of direct federal dollars into the state of Tennessee? Yeah. Well, one thing you've got to uh, remember, and that's, I, I think that's a good question for uh, TDOT as they, as they come before you because they, they, I know, are following that on a, on a daily basis, and we've got some meetings set up with them so that we better understand the same question. Um, but... Remember that the infrastructure plan that has just been passed is a multi-year is a is a multi-year bill, and so when you look at forty to sixty billion, whatever the number is, is going to be over like ten years, and so that won't be available on an annual basis. Um, so um, I would direct that to them. I, it sounds I think it's a little high, but. Uh, uh, but but they'll have the latest number. Just one point of clarification before I finish. If 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 the twenty billion dollar number is, is close to being accurate, does that include? And I'll use an example of of the Upper Cumberland area, where Ryan Williams and I live. We've received about one point two billion dollars of stimulus money to individuals. Mm -hmm. So that increase the spending in the upper common, maybe by 1.2 billion, maybe people saved it, I don't know. But is the $20 billion number that you gave me, does that include all the individual payments that were received from the federal government, either through stimulus payments or through PPP, or is that in addition to the 20 billion? No, that, that would include, as you remember I mentioned the three buckets, those dollars that went directly to individuals, those that went through it to individuals or entities through the state and, and then dollars that came through CRF for us to dispense. Um, those are the three buckets and it would include, it would include that. Thank you very much. And yeah. you and your staff are clearly well versed in the budget and I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I um, have no more questioners on my list. I want to thank you all again, not only for being here with us today, but for the yeoman's work that um, 
I mean, as someone mentioned earlier, it's always a, a tough job in F and A, but uh, with the addition of the federal stimulus dollars and working through this whole COVID process, you all have really had your hands full and you managed it adm admirably, and I uh, appreciate that. And working with um, David and Tony and you, Commissioner, to just um, on FSAG and some other opportunities that I've had, I see the commitment that you have to the state and to making sure that we do what all of us are interested in is that make sure that we utilize these federal dollars for the betterment of Tennesseans and that we do so in a way that is um, as responsible as possible and that we're we're being very careful. Uh, again, this is, this is my mantra, so I'll say it one more time, to not spend non-recurring dollars on recurring things. So um, thank you again for all that you all do, and thank the folks in your department. Thank you, Chair Hazelwood. You are preaching to the choir down here, so thank you very <laughs> I much. I know. I'm, I'm preaching you. to the broader audience. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank, <laughs> thank you, you, members. Appreciate it. We will now transition to um, our Department of Education. I know there were some questions earlier that you may want to hold and bring back to them. Yes, sir. Okay. Welcome. We have a large group of people um, representing the Department of Education. I know that uh, Commissioner Swin could not be with us, so we'll have to tell her it takes five people to replace her or uh, even attempt to. But we thank you for being here. And I uh, would just ask that you introduce yourselves, and I believe that you have a presentation for us. And I should have mentioned this earlier. These presentations are on the dashboard. So um, they're available for members there. We have some paper copies as well. And for those folks who are, might be watching this at home or in their offices, um, those, that will be available um, for them as well. So with that, thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you, Chair Lading. Uh, Sam Piercy, Deputy Commissioner of Operations. I'll let the rest of the team introduce themselves. Good morning, Eve Carney, Chief of Districts and Schools. Good morning, Drew Harpool, Assistant Commissioner for Finance. Charlie Bufalino, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and Legislative Affairs. Good morning, Regina, Speaker of Parliament. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Commissioner Piercy, did, uh, did you want to jump just right in? Get us underway? Yes, ma'am. Uh, before we do get started, I just want to say uh, the commissioner sends her apologies. She had a prior commitment out of state, um, so she appreciates your understanding and allowing uh, the team to take a crack at this conversation. Um, to get started, I just want to reinforce that everything we've done with our COVID relief dollars from the feds has continued to align to the best for all strategic plan with our focus on academic student readiness and educators. So that has been a consistent conversation throughout this period and just want to reinforce that that is where we uh, continue to align our resources and our efforts. Just a quick overview of what we hope to hit on today for you briefly. Uh, we'll start with an overview of our federal funds uh, with a specific emphasis on the funds that have been dedicated to education. Um, albeit we have many funds from a lot of sources, we'll, we'll kind of hone in on a couple of them specifically for the purposes of our conversation today. Then we'll focus in on our district spending updates. I know that has been a big question of how our LEAs are doing on their spending part as 90% of the largest buckets of these funds go straight out to our school districts. And then we'll close out with some of our strategic investments at the state level. And so with that, I will turn it over to Drew. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for, for having us. So starting off with our federal award summary, um, the majority of our funds were in the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, we just refer to it as ESSER, uh, and the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, known as GEAR. Um, that's where the majority of the conversation this morning in our, our presentation will be, uh, and as you can see, that's the overwhelming majority of dollars that we have received as part of, of the various relief bills. Um, one big thing on the ESSER funds is that 90% had to be sent out to LEAs by requirement of the ESSER funds. So 90% had to be awarded out to each of the local education agencies. This slide is to indicate the various periods of performance. So periods of performance are when, when LEAs are allowed to do the work under each of those grants. The big note is, one, these are very overlapping. ESSER 1, 2, and 3 are extremely overlapping in when they're allowed to be used, and they can all be dated back to March. So when we're thinking of them from a state perspective and when we're thinking about them from a district perspective, it's encouraging everyone to, to use the, each grant um, for the maximum period of availability that we have available and shift between as necessary to ensure maximum usage. We want the districts to get the full benefit of each of these dollars. Um, the big flag is everything can be dated back to, to March. This slide here is an indication of each of the grant awards and, and kind of where we are on the percent spend. The big flag is given the various periods of performance and when each of these awards drop off, this is kind of what you would expect to see in terms of percent spent. You can see that the 1.0s are significantly more spent down, the 2.0s a little bit less, 3.0s much less. That's kind of what you would expect to see. The other flag is that most of these grant awards were intended to go over the entire period of performance, so stretching out to 9, 30, 20, 24, um, such that districts are gonna be using these funds for, for the next several years. We wouldn't expect them all to be used immediately. And with that, I'll flip it over to Eve. Good morning. Um, on this circular graphic, you will see uh, the amount of the ESSER funds that have been reimbursed to districts from ESSER 1, 2, and 3. Uh, again, 90% of the funds go uh, to school districts, and this is reflective of what has been reimbursed to date. As Drew just noted, and we would expect, almost all of ESSER 1 has been um, reimbursed, almost a third of ESSER 2, and only 1% of ESSER 3. These are metrics we track at the department uh, and produce uh, these heat maps that you see on the right-hand side of the slide uh, monthly. They are also included in your packet, uh, and, it, and those are differentiated between ESSER 1, 2, and 3 with the different periods of availability or performance on the top of each. This slide um, represents kind of where we are with the ESSER 3 funding applications and plans specifically. Um, this bucket of relief funding is under the American Rescue Plan and had significantly more requirements uh, than ESSER 1 and 2. Uh, they are noted in the table where you see on the left column uh, the list of requirements uh, from needs assessment, community um, engagement checklist, health and safety plan, the public facing plan, and the spending document. Uh, currently, we are um, in the process of finalizing the reviews. Um, we are, as of Friday, 89% uh, of all of the 730 documents have been reviewed and approved, uh, and we are in the, in the final stages of uh, approving uh, additional funding applications uh, and expect to have those completed by November the 30th. I know there have been a, a quite a few questions about where we are uh, with all of these applications and plans. Um, I will just say this, we have a very uh, rigorous review process, not just of the funding application, but of all components of the plan. Uh, that, is, that is the reason that we are taking uh, time uh, to do them well. There is a significant amount of oversight expected by the U.S. Department of Education on this as well as additional data reporting that will be required annually over the life of the grants. And so to be good stewards of those funds, we felt it was necessary to have a rigorous review process, and that is what we are doing. Uh, it's public money, it's taxpayer money. I take that very seriously and want to ensure that what we put forth and approve um, is of high quality and aligned with the needs of individual districts. And so we actually will, I'll put a little plug in, um, we actually were called out as one of the few states that had a rigorous review process by the Edgenomics Lab at Georgetown University. So 
Uh, these things take time with 730 plans to review. And so that is kind of where we are in that note. Uh, we will also be working with districts over the next several months to do the first round of data collection. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education continues to uh, update their template, even as late as last week. Uh, we still do not have the final template, and it right now is at 38 pages. So it's no small feat. We're working really hard to uh, support and prepare districts for what will be required. Uh, last but not least, we just want to highlight a few of the key strategic initiatives uh, that we've leveraged the federal relief funding to support. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but wanted to certainly highlight these as the General Assembly played an integral role, especially in those top two bullets around the Literacy Success Act and the launch of Reading 360, with $111.5 million in investments to date. Tennessee Allcore, we're excited that we have over 50% of our district signed up to participate in an early launch of Tennessee Allcore. Uh, so 201 million dedicated to that, and an additional 46 million invested in online resources and supports to improve data systems for districts. And our student readiness priority, we're especially excited about the innovative high school initiatives and the supports around that uh, for promoting post-secondary success for our students. We had over 24 districts participate in our initial cohort for innovative high schools. Um, and that, that initiative is about 30 million of that 67.5. I'll also just identify that this bucket includes some of the initiatives the General Assembly asked us to look into around a career readiness assessment and an attendance recovery tool. Um, the last bucket, educators, 17.3 million. As we've discussed before, we continue to see a uh, large potential risk of retirement among our teacher pipeline. And so investing there to ensure that we have grow your own programs and other supports like that for educators uh, remains a top priority for us at the state level. Again, this slide just recaps some of those wins uh, that we are excited to celebrate, especially around the early reading training with over 10,000 educators having participated over the summer um, and 67% of our districts participating in early literacy networks. That is part of our support to have ongoing coaching for teachers and making sure that we have a robust, well-rounded uh, academic support program for educators, especially in the early literacy space. We also have a note in here about our decodable kits. Uh, almost 58,000 families ordered decodables to be sent directly to their homes to do support between the parent and the child. So a, a high uptake on that initiative that we are glad to see. In the student readiness space, we spoke about the innovative high schools already. Uh, AP Access for All, 81% of our districts are participating, meaning our students have more opportunity to participate in those post-secondary pipeline support processes. And then in our Grow Your Own space, 65 grants issued to 14 educated prep providers, providing 682 participant seats. So again, just, just a little snapshot of what we have so far to date. Um, and with that, Chair Lady, we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And um, we do have uh, several. And I just I want to just note it was mentioned, but I want everybody here to understand these ESSER funds, they are reimbursable funds. The districts do not get the monies until they have obligated and spent them. So um, again, that's I think that's important to understand that the districts aren't sitting on a large pile of money, that uh, those dollars are only reimbursed after expended on an approved um, plan and methodology. So. Um, with that, the first questioner I have is Leader Lambert. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to the department and for all of y'all's hard work. I, I say this both as a, as a legislator and as a parent of two children in public schools in Sumner County. Um, our county specifically, and I think folks throughout the state, have done a really, really good job of, keep, job of keeping kids in school and for fighting really hard to make sure that the uh, losses that we suffered and that they suffered in their educational journey have been caught up and continue to be so. So along that line, along those lines, um, the department uh, indicated that you had a total of 24 new FTEs and nine contractors that were added for the state administration relief funds. 22 of these positions are to be paid for through the ESSER 3.0 funds, if I remember correctly. So have all 24 been filled at this juncture? Then I have a few follow-ups. Certainly, we have not filled quite all of them yet, but we're, we're in the process and they're all posted. Okay, to be filled. roughly how many? Have, um, Madam Chairman, may I go back and forth a bit or would you like prefer to come Certainly. back to the chair? Thank you, Ben. No, you can 
feel free to volley for a while and, <laughs> and unless you go too long. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> just cut me off when I need to be. So uh, approximately how many have been filled then? I don't have that exact number in front of me, but we're happy to get it to you. If you don't mind, just get it to myself and the rest of the committee. Just send that out to us. Uh, just want to know how, you know, how we're going as far as implementing that. Absolutely. And then, and I don't know if these have been filled or not, but the two FTEs that oversee the Rethink K-12 through work, have those been filled at this juncture? Yes, sir, those have. Okay. And are those funded through federal grant funds? Yes, sir, they are. Okay, perfect. Um, specifically, what are those 24 positions for? Like, what exactly, once those are fully, you know, um, both, obviously they're fully funded, once they're filled, what are those going to be utilized for? I know it's for the administration of those dollars, but it's, I mean, it's 24 new spots. What exactly are we looking at there? Yes, sir. So they're spread of both operational supports and programmatic initiative oversight. So we have a handful of positions that may support, say, the Grow Your Own initiative or like the Connected Literacy part counts for two of those positions. Those people are responsible for both oversight and federal reporting requirements as well as technical assistance to districts. As you can imagine, the, the operational side of this is that with almost $4.5 billion of federal relief fund coming into the agency, we also have other responsibilities in terms of processing a number of procurements, um, managing those budgets from a financial perspective, those components. So a handful of those positions are reserved for those operational supports as well. And I think there's nine contractor positions as well. Is, what's the purpose of those and would you, how would you envision those being utilized? So I believe that the, the nine positions you're referencing, and, and happy to get with you after and get more information on those specifically, um, we do have a number of contractors that we are using to support um, the uh, data system development, and so a lot of those would fall into that bucket. So when you add up kind of all of that, and obviously there's a significant expense, um, really kind of two things. One are all of these positions going to be utilized in a way that's going to make it easier on our school districts to be able to both access these funds and utilize these programs? And then two, if the answer to that question is yes, I saw you all kind of nodding with me there, so I'm assuming it's going to be yes in a moment. Um, once those ESSER funds are gone, I would assume that these positions would disappear as well. How do you envision continuing through after the next several years have, um, you know, occurred and, and we've expended those funds? What would happen after that? Yes, sir. So to your first question, yes. If, if those people aren't helping to support the grant initiatives and districts being able to leverage them, then we're not doing our job. So yes, they are intended to do just that. Um, in terms of the, the plan at the end of the grant period, we have already made the commitment those positions, all 24 of them, and there's actually a handful of others there, will be sunset at the end of the, the ESSER grant period in September of 2024. Um, we have made that planning internally, and so we have uh, invested to make sure that the staff that we bring on board are aware of that timeline. Um, as vacancies become available at the department, if we have strong staff members, we obviously want to make sure they have a good place to land with us and we retain good talent. But what I would say from a program perspective is that a lot of these initiatives are high investments during the grant period and intended to settle in more to standard district practice as we get going. And so at that point, it should be less of a burden at the state level to implement and or become part of our standard practice and we reserve the capacity elsewhere to continue that programming. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My last question. Um, so four and a half billion dollars of the people's money, and we're spending it in education on these particular programs. At the end of all of that, when all of these programs have been implemented, when you guys have overseen them, and we've had, you know, all of these folks we just talked about hired to try to help administer them, uh, what can we expect um, has occurred with our children, our teachers, our school systems, um, and hopefully what has occurred in a positive way so that our children are served better in their educational journey is. What, what's going to be the goal? Kind of sum it up just in, you know, 30 seconds or something on, you know, $4.5 billion spent. What's the benefit that we're going to see? Sir, I don't know that you all could have labeled your, your special session bill any more appropriately in that space from uh, – taking care of learning loss remediation and accelerating kids. It's not just about catching up from what damage happened during the pandemic, but about realigning the trajectory for where we want kids to go. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman Baum, you're next on my list. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I wanna thank the team for all your hard work spending these federal funds and spending them effectively. It looks like if we look at all three ESSER parts, a majority of the funds have not been distributed down to the LEAs. 
Do you feel like we're on pace as as expected, or have unexpected issues arisen that have has delayed that? Thanks for that question. Um, you're correct. The largest part of the SR three, uh, SR one, two, and three is in SR three. That is the piece we are currently in the final stages of reviewing. I would say this: um, as we have, as a state, navigated this kind of federal. Uh, changing in administration at the federal level, additional requirements being added after the grant was awarded to states, the continued updates of those guidance documents, as well as the updated templates for the data reporting, it does make it a little more challenging. Uh, what my goal is, is to administer these funds uh, effectively and well, and make sure that we are reducing the burden on districts as much as feasibly possible, uh, knowing that when you have this t amount of money, there will be um, requirements to those funds, and our job is just to ensure that as that we're being good stewards of those dollars, but also trying to um, work with districts as much as possible to streamline that, because they're, they're juggling a lot of other things right now, and it's our job to help them uh, navigate this, this, these uncertain times. Chairman Baum. Are the LEAs doing the kinds of things in general that they need to do to draw down these funds? They are, and it's a process because even in the ESSER three, there was a there were a number of requirements that required stakeholder engagement, a needs assessment, a health and safety plan, a, a public facing plan, and then a spending document that then documents how they're going to pay for all of those things. Uh, they have worked really hard to uh, do that with fidelity and to do it well. Uh, as you might expect, a number of needs, the funds are relatively flexible, but also ensuring that we have the appropriate uh, documentation in place such that as the oversight begins, both at the state level and the federal level, districts are set up and have exactly what they will need uh, to continue to spend the money well. But they are doing uh, just really hard work and good work uh, around the development and implementation at this time. Okay. And maybe one last follow-up, kind of building on what Leader Lamberth was discussing. In terms of the FTEs and contractors we've hired in order to help distribute these federal funds, is there going to be any need to hire additional ones, or do you think you've got the number that you need to complete this, this project through ESSER 3? Well, based on, well, I'll start and I'll let Sam wrap. Um, the positions that we have that are dedicated to supporting the district plans, not initial review, ongoing monitoring, um, technical assistance, we feel like we have sufficient staff for that. And, and just to follow up to that, um, in our previous presentation from um, FNA, they mentioned, uh, you know, they they could have hired hundreds of accountants to try and keep up with these dollars. They went outside because this is this influx of money is temporary. So uh, again, just to go back to, uh, do we envision, because we, we're implementing a lot of new programs, we're um, doing a lot of um, new, there are just a lot of new tools that we're putting into place. So once the funds are expended, how do we view supporting both through personnel and dollars uh, for these ongoing programs? It's gonna be very hard to do something for two or three years in your school system and then they say, oh, whoops, we don't have the money to do that anymore. So uh, can you speak to that just a little bit? Yes, ma'am. So, so two things that I would identify. Um, first and foremost, this is actually a, a standard practice for the department. While it's a massive scale in terms of the sum of money, we run grants to school districts as a regular part of our business. So being able to redirect internal capacity to support this is the reason we don't have you know, the need to just keep billowing out and, and bringing on more and more staff. And primarily that's so that our districts have the same experience in terms of oversight and supports with these dollars that they are used to getting with their other federal dollars through the department. Um, and, and to that same point, Chair Lady, I think that is also the reason why once we get towards the end of this grant period, the department will not need additional staff to cover that part. Uh, one of the things that we will focus on in the later years of the grant is ensuring sustainability plans with districts and supporting them in that endeavor, making sure they've thought through how to scale down the work they have started or embedded in their existing resources and capacity. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Whitson. 
Thank you, Chair Lady Hazelwood. Uh, just a quick question. This is kind of follow-up, too. But first of all, let me say I appreciate the job y'all have done during these challenging times. As a grandparent with grandkids in our public schools, uh, one with special needs, um, it's been a tough, but um, I'm proud that there are uh, students in the Tennessee public school system. Um, this has to do with challenges, and you may have hit on these already, but how does the department plan to address issues they have encountered with obligating the funds within the mandated timelines? So I would say this, um, we worked really hard to um, get the allocations out to districts as quickly as possible so that they know how much they had and would be awarded uh, once they went through that application process. And so that was something that we did very early on. Uh, we've also provided a, a pretty strong amount of resources and technical assistance so that they can use these funds and understand the parameters because as I noted it's they are flexible funds but there still are requirements around those things and so um, that has been a challenge because um, as we noted SR1, SR2, SR3 those are th uh, three different application processes and so they are they too are trying to manage how best to utilize and maximize those funds knowing that there are different end dates for each of those and so really it's just been about having a team that is strongly committed to being responsive to districts and to try to move these uh, application approvals forward uh, as quickly as possible on those on the heat maps that were included in your packet you'll note that uh, kind of there's quite a bit of uh, a almost all districts still have SR2 funds remaining uh, mm -hmm. in there. And then, of course, um, most of them have expended SR1. So uh, as if we notice that districts are, are challenged and are not moving uh, those funds forward, uh, we take extra steps to ensure that we're checking in with them, making sure, uh, because honestly, they, are, they have capacity challenges as well um, with their personnel. Yes, and do you think y'all will be able to meet the mandated timelines in, uh, with these funds? Yes. Okay. And one more question. Chair yeah, Whitson. Chairman Whitson. Thank you, ma'am. Has the department faced any uh, issues that we, uh, you may want to highlight while drawing down the federal funding, uh, dealing with the federal government? <laughs> I can start or someone else can. Um, I can. It, it, you want to start? Certainly. So, so far from the, the practice of actually getting the money from the federal government, we haven't experienced any, any issues in the, the technical side of the drawdown system. I think the, the largest problem that we've had has been, and you just alluded to this on the state side, just meeting some of those obligation deadlines. It's a lot of money that needs to go out really fast. Um, we're very happy to be working with our, our partners over at CPO and the Department of General Services um, and with the Contracts Approval Group over at the Comptroller's Office. Everyone has been super supportive in, in helping us make sure that these things get through from a procurement side. Um, at that point, it's now just about the, the technical side of drawing, which we haven't had any issues with. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lee. I do, Madam Chairman. I see that we've been joined by legislative legend himself, Re a former Representative Curry Todd. Please make him feel welcome. Uh, next on the list, Chairman Hicks. Thank you, Madam. I don't know if I can follow that. Good, good to see you, Representative. Got a quick question. First of all, before I do get started, let me say thank you all for being here, and Commissioner Buffalino, I thank you for your responsiveness, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Jay Klein back there uh, sitting back behind you. So thank you all. You're always very responsive when I reach out, so I do want to say thank you. As I look at some of the uh, uses for the federal funds, one thing that uh, did pique my interest was the Best for All um, Central Portal. Uh, it looked like it was earmarked about $30.8 million. Um, that was back in 2021, uh, expended four, about $4 million, and then, of course, there was some carried over. Um, my question is now, it looks like probably somewhere around $25 million has still been earmarked. What is the status of that portal? Is it completed, or is there still more work to do? Can you kind of hit on that? Absolutely. So one thing about the Best for All Central is it includes both the technical side of the build-out, uh, which I think Deputy Commissioner Pierce will t hit here in a second, and the programmatic side. So this includes some of the supports for, for videos and things that we've placed on the website. So a lot of those supports are, are completed already and are, are getting posted as we, as we speak. For the technical side of it, the build-out for the, the portal, I'll turn it over. 
Yes, sir. I, I would say that we intend for Best for All Central to be an ongoing support for school districts. So as, as Drew mentioned, we have both content creation that is ongoing and hitting additional content areas as we continue to develop out those materials. Um, and then we still have the, the technical build out, which you'll be familiar. The goal there is to make sure that we have solid integration in our data systems. We are a very data rich state. And the idea is that we make sure teachers and educators and school leaders have access to that data in a way that they can actually use it to drive decisions at the local level. And I'll say this as far as utilization of this, and which I want to ask you about, but I'll remind you during the time that this was actually rolled out, I think literally districts, their hair was on fire, just to be honest with you. And so I, I don't think it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I would encourage you all to make sure you go back and it wouldn't be a bad idea to really get this out. This is good information on this website, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not sure a lot of districts still know about this. So, again, and it was just the timing. It's nothing that the department could have done different. It was just the priorities were certainly changed during this particular time the rollout came, so I would encourage you to do that. And as I finish up, I guess what is the utilization on that? And it may, I guess that may be the reason why if, if the utilization is a little bit low, but everybody I, I ask, they use it, they like it. They say it, it's really good, but a lot of our folks don't even realize what it is. So thank you all again. Thank you for being here. And again, uh, thank you for the assistance that all, you always give. Leader Gant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate the service y'all provide the state. Um, question I've got is, there are there any particular regions of the state that we're using the terminology grow your own um, in, in, in a manner here in the state to promote te uh, students from students to teachers? I believe in the original onset of the program, it was a partnership uh, with Austin P University and some of the surrounding districts. But prior to that, I'm not aware of other districts who are leveraging that title specifically. But so, so we're currently, Madam Chair, if I could. Yes. So we're currently not utilizing that is what you're saying. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We, we are leveraging it as part of our grant programs. Yes, sir. We have a few cohorts of Grow Your Own. And that was on that final slide um, down here at the last bullet up there. So those, those district partnerships with uh, ed prep providers are using the term Grow Your Own. Okay, and what district are we talking about referring to? I'm happy to give you the list. There's a number of districts who are involved in those partnerships. So is it statewide or is it West Tennessee, Middle East? I believe we have a spread across the state, but they're generally regional clusters of districts that are partnering with an ed prep provider in their area. Okay. And lastly, Madam Chair, um, is the department utilizing any of the federal funding to retain teachers that we currently have? Not as part of a statewide initiative. Do you want to speak to district plans? Sure. So as, as we've noted a couple of times, 90% of these funds go to school districts, and then they are the ones who make the determinations on what they do with those dollars. If a district is having issues with teacher retention, they are absolutely uh, allowed to use both the relief funding and then their other federal dollars that they also receive on a recurring basis uh, for retention if they choose to do so. And we do have a number that are doing that. Leader Gant. Do, you, do, you, do, do we have a percentage of the use of these federal funds across the state? Specific to using it for retention or Correct. just generally. Um, I don't have that number with me today. I, I know we are tracking uh, within our application how districts are utilizing these funds in kind of some of these broader cate categories, and I'm happy to, to, to compile that and, and provide it. Leader Gant. So we are tracking it, is what you're saying? Yes. We just, we just don't have the figures with us, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, if you could provide that to the chair lady, that would be appreciated very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And uh, just to follow up on the Grow Your Own, I think that's incredibly um, important. I hope that the educational institution in my region is involved. I know that they've been doing some work with um, some of the county that they sit in and some of the surrounding counties on this for a while, um, just teacher prep and making sure that the teachers that are graduating from their establishment are actually prepared to go into the classroom. But it's it's very difficult um, when you look at at the those students who are choosing education as their major. 
um, it sometimes seems like it's maybe more of a fallback position than a first choice. So I, I think any work that we can do to encourage smart, intelligent, good folks who have good communication skills or can develop those skills to go into teaching because I don't, people may disagree with me, but I don't care how many dollars we put into education, what other things we do, if we don't put good teachers in the classroom, we're not going to get good results. So anything that we can do to improve the teaching capabilities of those that are already in the classroom and certainly to make sure that we're getting the best and brightest to at least consider education uh, as a field and I think those would be dollars incredibly well spent. Uh, and with that, I'll get off my soapbox. Chairman Zachary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning to you all. And while it's great that you guys are here, I'm going to say that I am disappointed that our former colleague and Speaker Pro Tem is not here sitting in that seat, so we can't grill him a little bit. So next time you come back, I would request that you bring him with you, please. Um, I have some questions related to the connectivity grants. Can you speak to how you're utilizing those grants, uh, specifically working with, a, with a ECD to target unserved versus underserved, how many families we're hitting, just overall speak to the, the utilization of those grants, please. Yes, sir. So I'll, I'll separate out um, some of the partnership with ECD that's a little bit newer in the works and the, the relief funds that we use to do connectivity grants very, very early on in the pandemic period. So using coronavirus relief fund dollars, uh, the department released two different technology support initiatives um, late in the spring of 2020 to try to support districts and, and giving technology access to their students. One of those was a $50 million grant to support device purchases for districts, and the other was a connectivity <laughs> grant uh, designed to support districts purchasing hotspots, MiFi devices that they could send home with students on an as-needed basis. So those two programs were run back in the spring of 2020 and very quickly kind of sunset. We only had a limited amount of time with those federal dollars. So we had decent uptake in those. And again, those were kind of before some of the release of ESSER 2.0 and 3.0 funds in a way that the state was looking to support districts. The, the partnership on um, additional connectivity with ECD is a relatively new initiative for us. So still learning a little bit more about um, taking the lead from them as the primary uh, players on that grand initiative. So happy to get more information for you on it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and then uh, something I'd like to bring up that we discussed briefly when uh, Commissioner Ely was here. Uh, at some point over the last couple of months, it may have been two months, it may have been six months ago, the way time how quickly these last 19 months have moved. You guys had provide, sent a form, I believe it was related to ESSER funds, to our LEAs re requesting specific information, I mean, very granular to the, to the tune of uh, like seating charts, contact tracing, some very detailed information that was explained to us that was being requested by the federal government, which created some serious concerns, at least for me. I won't speak to anybody else. Um, and so that raised more questions about the guidance, the strings, the requirements from any of those funds coming down and us not fully, fully understanding as this body what those requirements may be. So can you speak to that particular instance? And it doesn't have to be a lot. I just want to speak to that specifically. And then is there anything else that you think would be concerning to us if we find out two months from now, six months from now, information sent to our LEAs, our elected school board, then they come to us asking for us for, for, for clarification that we need to be prepared for. So specific to the, the, what you just described, one of the required elements, and again, these were requirements that were placed following state awards being distributed. And so one of the requirements is what we were calling a safe, the safe and healthy plan. Um, and so that's one of, and, and on the last slide of the, your deck is an appendix uh, that has a little more information about that. One of the things that they required in that, um, that safe and healthy plan was that, that these districts try to follow CDC guidance to the extent practicable is the language that they use and updated every six months. They did not mandate certain things. They, they referenced some of the CDC guidance specifically because it continues to evolve and emerge. Uh, but that is the requirement that, that we are, uh, that every, 
subrecipient every LEA is required to do. Uh, it is it is not uh, something that they prescribed other outside of those parameters. But the, the expectation is that they are revisiting it uh, every six months. Okay. And to the second part of your question about are there things that this body might mm -hmm. need to know. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, we continue to monitor very closely the data collection requirement that uh, states are being asked to do. Uh, and of course, that would be what we get our data from our districts and how they are utilizing that. Uh, that would be the one thing that as we continue to, um, I think right now there's one more iteration of this data template and that's what we are kind of, we're planning off of the most current document now. Um, I know that a number of states, including us, have expressed concern about the granularity and, and some of the data reporting elements. That would be the only other thing I would flag at this time. One more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the same question to you that I'd asked to Commissioner Ely. Are there any, is it specific to the Department of Education, are there any requirements or strings or guidance that we would not know on the front end that would be provided on the back end that would change the trajectory of how we're distributing those funds or whatever it may be because their their response was typically we have most of that on the front end but specific to the department of education is there anything that could change on the back end once we agree to accept those funds is there language in there that allows them to amend that on the front end when the state <clears throat> accepts the funds we sign assurances that we will implement the, the program as directed, that we will do the data collection, that we will follow subsequent guidance provided by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and, and that is something, of course, that um, we have seen some shifts in, not significant. For example, initially uh, pre-K wasn't something that they were allowing. They have since updated their guidance to um, post-award uh, to allow that. And so those are the types of things we're seeing. Um, but I would say that uh, the state plan that we have put forth and approved, uh, that is what we are, we are committed to implementing. If we change, we would have to go in and amend our plan. But, but typically, um, they, of course, are the ones who will be responsible for providing guidance to states uh, on that. And, of course, that's at their discretion. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Next on our list is Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll echo uh, Chairman Hicks had mentioned thanks to to the team out there. Jay Klein, very thank you very much for the work that you've done to help me recently as well. Um, I, I like to think long term, and and on slides, I believe it was slides nine and ten, where you give us a summary of the strategic investments that we've made, and some of the successes, at least short term successes that we've seen. Tell me how. Well, and as we're looking to renovate the BEP formula. How are we looking at building on these successes uh, in future budget years beyond these ESSER funds and beyond the funds we're talking about? Yes, sir. So in, in terms of the formula review, the biggest thing that I would identify is that um, the, the current strategy of engagement is to leverage everything up through the subcommittees that have been established, the 18 subcommittees and the steering committee comprised of legislators. What we are seeing and encouraging is that people take a look at the initiatives that have been invested in during this time. I think everyone will probably remember the heavy investments that came during the race to the top period. Um, and we saw a lot of things that move strategic bars forward and we saw a lot of pilot uh, opportunities where people were trying to see what works. Um, we know the same is true at the local level with these funds as well. They're able to invest in some major strategic moves and they're trying out some new things as they realign trajectories for their students. I think what we are encouraging is that those conversations and experiences be brought up to the subcommittees as that's where we'll surface what's working, what isn't, and what should land in a new formula recommendation. Chairman Hawk. Thank you. And, and I was a part of the race to the top discussions and, and we thought that was a lot of money at the time. It was half, <laughs> half a billion dollars, $502 million to be exact. And we thought that was a huge amount of money at the time. And, and the, the word we gave local school districts was don't plan for this money to go beyond X date. Um, so I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we've got something that is working, these summer camps that we've got that are working and we're seeing some anecdotal success, then we need to continue those. So as, as we continue these discussions, that has to happen. If I could switch gears just a little bit and 
and I, I work, tried to work in the space of capital improvements, uh, renovations to our bricks and mortar that we have, K-12 through facilities out there. Tell me how some of these stimulus funds are, how we're able to use those funds, how local districts are able to use those funds. Explain the procurement process, because I'm afraid there may be a disconnect um, as we're talking earlier, the school districts need to turn in receipts and be reimbursed. Well, you can't really do that on some of these uh, uh, some of these procurements for for renovations and and bricks and mortar. Can you help me out with that, please? I'll get started and probably have Drew chime in in a moment. But what we're seeing is because of the large investment in SR3 and the allowable, about allowability for capital outlay, uh, we are seeing districts take advantage of that, knowing that these are one-time funds, and they're trying to make sure that they are investing in something that isn't recurring and isn't going to tax them in the years to come. Uh, one of the things around that, though, is the requirements that when you are sp you spending um, federal dollars on a contract that you have other requirements, such as the Davis-Bacon Act, that would be required. And so one part of what we have been trying to support districts in doing is preparing them for those pieces and ensuring that they won't have issues with their procurement down the road. Um, but it isn't so much uh, in the space of, say, a capital improvement, it would be something that they would enter, enter into a contract with, perhaps, uh, with a provider that would uh, be responsible for uh, overseeing or, and delivering on that capital improvement. And so it would be the contract that would then obligate the federal dollars. Um, and then it, of course, would be something that we would monitor over time. Drew, do you have anything to add on that? The, the large addition is in, in the federal requirements. There's an entire appendix of the Uniform Grant Guidance dedicated to nothing but contract terms for capital projects. Um, so that's been the biggest flag on all of our guidance is, is uh, Eve mentioned a moment ago, the Davis-Bacon Act, Clean Water Act, and, and several others that are not typically in procurement contracts that must be there by federal guidance. Uh, but otherwise, in terms of reimbursement, as they experience some of those under their, their reimbursement plan and pay those dollars out, they're able to request them from us, and we, we reimburse as quickly as we can. And I would just add to that one other thing. Um, because capital improvements aren't something that typically would be allowable with federal education grants, districts are having uh, quite a few questions about that. So that's potentially some of it's kind of a new learning curve for them as well, knowing that this is not a traditional use of the federal dollars that they receive on a recurring basis. Chairman Hawk, do you have a follow-up? Thank you, Chair Lady, very much. I, I do, and I know you've got frequent um, frequent webinars with directors of schools and folks like that. That may be a good thing to bring up in, in future days because there I have gotten several questions and comments about that just this morning as we're sitting here. One quick follow-up and, and just to put a cap on this, we're talking about the ESSER funds. Um, Percentage-wise, where are we in terms of dollars that have been allocated to the Department of Education and how many how many of those dollars have been spent? How many are unspent? Can we Can we kind of put a, a cap on, on the dollars where we are now and what we're looking at over the next uh, three budgets to get us out to the 25 budget year. Certainly across the, the gears and the Essers total right now, we have spent about $571 million. That also includes the, or that's just the, the gears and the Essers. So a significant amount of money has actually paid to school districts and to partners um, throughout both of the, the pieces of, of the grants. Representative Sparks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Piercy. <clears throat> you know, the amount of money that we're spent on education, I've got the U.S. debt clock pulled up. I don't know if y'all have ever seen it. It's 20, 28 trillion, 960, 28.965 trillion dollars. You know, and I like something Ben Franklin said, that investment education pays the best interest. Do you, I mean, how confident are y'all with all this money that's coming down that it's going to improve test scores, it's going to improve graduation rates, uh, it's going to improve retention of teachers that we seem to be losing and recruiting of teachers. How confident are y'all with, with all this influx of money that it will make a difference? Thank you for the question. What I would say first and foremost is a call back to the chair lady's statement. It's not just going to be about these dollars, but the
the people that we're investing in along the way. Um, so it matters immensely uh, how school districts engage their communities in this work, how they engage with their partners, such as ed prep programs and community-based organizations, and how we at the state do the same. Um, so with that and, and with the amount of attention and emphasis that we are focused on in our engagement work at the state level, we do remain confident uh, that we'll achieve those outcomes we've set for ourselves. If I could, Sparks. you know, throughout all this adversity, it seems like maybe there's some opportunity. Have you seen the areas of um, uh, online learning really become much better than it was prior to COVID? I'll speak and then I may actually ask uh, Chief Luna if she wants to jump in as well. I think uh, overall what we've seen is there are opportunities in online learning, um, specifically some of the access points for like our AP Access for All program that, that gives an opportunity to students who wouldn't otherwise have it. Um, but we also know from, from the last year and a half that in-person is stronger for kids. So I think we've learned a lot about online learning in the last year and a half and we'll continue to do so. Um, and there's important ways that we can leverage that, but, but I think it's a balancing act from here on out. Chief Lynn? I would just chime in, especially when we were talking about AP Access for All. A lot of our rural communities prior did not have uh, many AP courses. As you can see, the increases, I mean, in South Central alone, it's 142% more AP courses are going on. Um, and those are opportunities for kids to get those early post-secondary credits that will transfer into potentially college. I would also say those innovative high school grants that were mentioned um, are really allowing districts to re-examine what high school looks like. It is not the same for every student. So this is really capitalizing on students being really engaged in some of those CTE opportunities, the work-based learning, the apprenticeships, and really um, partnering with the industry partners and some of those post-secondaries that it has allowed schools to think differently about what high school particularly looks like. Real quick, last question. I just text a few school board members and teachers. Um, one says that she's not gonna be teaching anymore. She's gonna try to call it quits next, next year. Another one's asking about school nurses. Um, my issue has been more social workers as well as nurses. And, uh, Chairman Hawks as well, but where are we at on school, more school nurses? So happy to pull the numbers for those. Uh, in terms of the state level, we have requirements on the, the nurse to student ratios that are funded in the BEP formula. Um, and I know from an engagement conversation that has certainly been a popular topic with our engagement groups as well for the subcommittees. Okay, thank you. Representative Garrett, you're recognized. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Um, we're talking lots of money with Esther, and I'm, I'm curious if an LEA um, doesn't spend it correctly, something happens, what, what processes are in place to make sure the money is spent appropriately? Then Thank I've got a follow-up question, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. That is part of what uh, we are charged with doing as the state agency. It's not just about approval on the front end. It's about ensuring fidelity of implementation throughout the entire grant period. Uh, the additional staff members that we have brought on uh, during the, for the duration of ESSER 1, 2, and 3 is intended to provide additional oversight to districts. We do regular, uh, some desktop monitoring. We do um, on-site monitoring, uh, as well as checks against things that are supposed to be reported and posted. Um, in the instance that there are times where things aren't going as, as they, number one, told us in the application that they, that they would, um, we uh, develop what we call a corrective action plan and we work very closely with the district to correct that. Um, our hope is that, that we get that corrected because uh, any payback against federal comes out of state dollars and, and that is part of the other piece of what we are charged with doing is uh, ensuring that we correct anything that is, um, against the requirements or against the uniform grants guidance, for example. Uh, but that, that happens every year as we monitor all of our districts, uh, especially with this influx of money, as you noted. Okay. So you bring up an interesting situation. Let's say all those actions 
oops, they're still an oops. We spent a million dollars over here and we didn't do anything. There's nothing for us to do with this. What happens in that instance is the local LEA, you said it comes from state dollars. Do they have to pay back the federal government a million dollars or is it coming back to you? What is that process if that should happen, practically speaking? So two things. That's part of the reason that we monitor all of the, throughout the entire period of availability because we want to stop anything early so that we aren't in a place that we get down the road and, and things have been misspent. But in the instance that that happens, ultimately uh, it comes back to the, the state and then we then are working with the districts to get that money repaid. Uh, it's not something that we expect, especially knowing that we have some very, you know, stringent practices and policies around that, but that is how it would work. Uh, anything that is, that is misspent, uh, we would work with that district to correct, but at the end of the day, the, the funds were awarded to the state, and that is part of our job and oversight. All right. Eve, thank you. You're Appreciate good. that. Our, I'll just add one thing to that. Our long-term sure. goal is to, to make sure that districts get the full benefit of all of the dollars. So a lot of the, the assistance that Eve has mentioned is about helping make sure that we can reallocate to appropriate and allocable programs if it happens within the timeline, make sure the district gets the full benefit. Worst case, if we're looking at payback to, to U.S. Ed, um, it is a conversation with U.S. Ed that we can try to do the same, find eligible programs, um, and that, but that ends up being fully at their discretion whether they will allow us to do that or not. But again, we want from state level for every district to get the benefit of every dollar. Okay. Thank you all very much. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Lady Chair. Thank you all for being here. As long as I've been in the legislature, I never had the privilege of serving on education committee so there's a lot I don't know about education uh, so if I ask a question it sounds a little stupid help me out what about the the B, new BEP formula that's coming is it going to be more friendly to districts and sizes in terms of numbers and so forth uh, could you all just elaborate a little bit on that or wh what can we expect Yes, sir. So first and foremost, and, and I, please, please give me a little grace in this response. Um, we don't have preconceived notions about what that formula will be. What we know is that we're listening to these subcommittees and they are raising the issues they want to see represented in a new formula should the legislature ultimately approve one. Um, so these types of conversations about um, small districts, rural districts, large urbans, things like that are things that are coming up in those subcommittee conversations. But ultimately, whether or not they will land in the formula will be at the discretion of the subcommittees and the steering committee for their recommendation. Representative Shaw. Thank you. Well, I, I would hope that they would be more friendly. I, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about what's fair and what's unfair about the BEP formula. So I, I'm looking for something at least that everybody can say this is better for all of us. I'd like to see that at least. But thank you for your response. Yes, sir. Do we have additional questions? Seeing none, well, again, we will report to the commissioner that you all did a credible job in representing her here. <laughs> Um, thank you for the work that's been done and that will be done to make sure that the, the dollars that we're talking about here are expended well. And um, at the end of the day, as I think several people have alluded to in their questions, what we all want to, to be able to say at the end of that day is that we have used these monies in a way that have made Tennessee students um, more prepared for the workplace, uh, for college, whatever um, their path is, and that we have teachers who are better prepared and um, hopefully willing to stay in the classroom because of the decisions that you all are making and that we are making um, as a legislative body. So thank you for the good work and we will look forward to seeing you again in January when we have our full budget hearings and or maybe whatever the date is when we are next together to discuss these issues. But thank you for being here.
Okay. All right, next up, we will be hearing from uh, the Department of Human Services. So we'll ask them to move to the table. Commissioner Carter, I see, is in the room. Thank you, Commissioner, and your staff for um, joining us here today. We look forward to hearing from you. And I don't believe that we got a, a PowerPoint or a presentation ahead of time from you all. So if you have um, something, I would direct everybody's eyes to the, to the screen. Or we, 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 we will walk you through it. All right. And we, I would ask that we would get a copy of that to put on dashboard and to, to have our, our files um, following your presentation. But again, thank you for being here. I know um, there's a lot of money flowing through a lot of, of different departments in the state of Tennessee, and uh, none with so uh, critical use, perhaps, as, as those that have, are coming through your department for for families that are in um, you know fairly dire straits and need immediate um, help and long-term help as well. So, um, Commissioner, if you could just walk us through the federal dollars that have come to your department, how those are being expended, and uh, what you expect to see as a result of those expenditures. We'd appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, uh, my name's Clarence H. H. Carter, and I'm uh, Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Human Services, and I'm pleased to be here with you this morning. I am joined at the table by our um, Deputy Commissioner for Operations, Melissa Hux, and also our Chief of Staff, Whitney Page. And, um, and, and I also asked to join us this morning, Madam Chair, um, our, our newest um, employee at DHS, who's been here all of two hours, Taylor Aliff, who you may know. <laughs> uh, um, and and I, I, I will... I, I will ask you. I will ask you not she to hold it again. Have, she should have been with you longer because I released her on Friday. So do you all <laughs> have bankers' hours? She doesn't come to work till nine. <laughs> uh, uh, so I will ask you not to hold it against us that we um, that we garnered a very significant employee. So uh, that's a tall ask. We'll okay. discuss it later. <laughs> we'll discuss it later. Okay. Um, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, in, 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 to be respectful of your time and questions today, I want to share just a couple of high-level comments with you and then, um, and then open it up to, to your questions. There, there have been four, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been four federal appropriations. Um, and for the Department of Human Services, the total of those four appropriations is $1.47 billion. Um, and and, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you in just a minute about a couple of those most significant ones. But we have currently um, expended about 580, um, just about $584 million of those with about $600 million in the pipeline. Um, and, 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 and so... Uh, <clears throat> Where that most significant appropriation has been is in the child care space. So of that $1.47 billion, $1.2 billion has been uh, child care um, appropriations. And what the uh, utilization of those funds uh, have been are for stabilizing the Tennessee child care system and um, ensuring that uh, we had a uh, pandemic child care, essential worker child care, where that enabled workers that had to work through the pandemic to be able to have access to, to, to child care. And so, and, and we are trying to strengthen the infrastructure of uh, Tennessee's child care system to make it affordable, accessible, and, and, uh, um, and available to, um, to all Tennesseans who, um, who need it. Uh, <clears throat> And, and so, as I said, the, the lion's share of that uh, appropriation has been child care. The, um, the second biggest bucket, if you would, would have been in, in the initial appropriation of the, uh, the CARES Act. 
and where we were appropriated 155 million. And we used the, an extensive network of Tennessee um, community-based service providers to help us to provide the kinds of services that, um, that Tennessee communities and families needed during the early part of the pandemic. And um, we, we found that mechanism of engaging those, uh, those service providers to be of significant benefit. Um, it, it allowed us not only to move a very significant amount of funding in a very short period of time, but to engage that broader Tennessee network in making it work. So um, w with that, Madam Chair, I, I will, would be pleased to um, turn it back to you and we will be happy to take any questions or, 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 or comments from the committee. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and I do have uh, several questions, beginning with, uh, I think, Representative Freeman, you're first on my list. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, there were uh, several awards uh, that have expired, and uh, according to your questionnaire, um, and went unexpended. Has the department returned any funding which was unexpended within the mandated time frame uh, to the federal government? If so, how much? So, so um, wh where we um, have been and will be returning uh, d dollars are going to be really in the supplemental nutrition assistance uh, program from an admin perspective. So the, again, the way the, uh, the SNAP program works is that the federal government pays 100% of the benefit. It shares the cost for administration with the state on about a 50-50 basis. And so because the, um, the COVID-related expenditures um, for the SNAP program were principally in increasing benefits to eligible individuals and families, they also provided a commensurate increase in, in administration funding as if we would have to increase our admin support. But because there weren't new eligibles, we didn't need to do that. And so therefore, that, that, that admin money from SNAP will be uh, re returned to the federal government. Right. One, one more question, please. <coughs> Certainly, Representative Freeman, follow up. Thank you. Um, so your department oversees several programs that received additional uh, federal funding uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, how did you advertise um, the enhanced programs uh, to ensure um, everyone knew of the uh, availability or the new programs? So, so um, t two answers to that. The, fir the first is, is that there was such an urgent need to, um, to, to, to move those dollars to the greatest impact that we, we couldn't set up any kind of additional communications mechanism. So what we did was we used the service network in order to do that. So for instance, in the CARES Act, okay, we, we used um, uh, a couple of hundred community-based organizations that were providing the services, they helped us get out the message to their, um, to their constituencies about the availability of that funding. And, and another example is in the pandemic employment benefits transfer program, where what happened there is because children um, received a free and reduced school lunch, but with them not being in school then, and then being at home, what we did was shift to providing the funding as opposed to the meals. We shifted to providing that um, in, a, um, in an electronic benefits transfer to the home. And so again, we used the school districts to be able to promote what we were doing on, on, um, on, on, that, um, on that basis. And, and so for the most part, we used the serving mechanisms in order to, um, to promote the availability of whatever the resource was. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Commissioner, good to see you. Best that I can right now. <laughs> we're, looking, we're both looking past Representative Sparks here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, no, don't you move. We can hear each other just fine, Representative. There you go. <laughs> so uh, drilling down into a little bit of the details on this, I mean, how did the department use the CCDF funding to address child care needs? I know you kind of hit broadly on that, but I know, well, I have a, a basic idea as to how that was, but can you get into a little bit of the weeds and the details on exactly how that funding was utilized? 
So, so um, to, to, to gonna get into some of that detail. So um, w one large expenditure, which is currently in the development process, is what they call stabilization grants. And so $500 million in stabilization grants was used for the purpose of just that, stabilizing existing child care providers. So uh, um, ensuring that we, we, had a, we had a pretty appreciable reduction in um, child care availability during the pandemic. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to ensure that existing providers were able to, uh, um, were, were able to continue to provide child care services. Um, another significant expenditure was um, pandemic child care for essential workers. Mm -hmm. And again, the notion of that is that there were um, Tennesseans that had to work during the pandemic. And so we wanted to ensure that they had funding to provide safe, healthy, and affordable child care for their, um, for their children. So that was a, another um, significant expenditure. And, um, and then another expenditure was um, um, increasing uh, the, 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 the dollar amount made available to some, to some families to be able to purchase safe, healthy, and affordable child care. So that would kind of be the, the, um, the, 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 the waterfront of the way that we use the funding. Leader Lambert. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And on that, I mean, the stabilization grants, I believe, were more one-time funding, and some of the increase in benefits are recurring funding. Is that accurate? That is correct. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And then what is the state of child care now in Tennessee? So when you look at all the programs that you all administer, I mean, you, you come from a very rich background of experience at both the federal and state level. You, I don't know if anyone knows your background in here, but uh, I was excited to see you hired in this particular position because you bring a lot to the table. Um, and I say this as a compliment and I think just an objective evaluation of, of your background. So I was, I'd love to just hear where you see we are in Tennessee right now in specifically these child care programs and maybe what the next step might be. So, so um, I, I, I appreciate the, um, the, the, the kind words, uh, I, and, and your question is pretty interesting. Um, our Representative Hazelwood, along with Senator Massey, um, were able to put together a piece of legislation to create a child care task force in Tennessee, and we are currently, that uh, task force is currently meeting to answer just that question. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the sort of state of, of child care in Tennessee. And what I will tell you <coughs> is that in the aggregate, um, <clears throat> the state of child care in Tennessee is in flux. We, we, we have a, um, a very um, rich and engaged knowledge base on, uh, on, on child care, where I think that we will need to grow in our capacity um, is, again, organizing all of our assets around um, maximizing uh, safe and, and affordable and accessible child care. And I believe that that task force will help us, will guide us in that direction. I would say we had a very interesting um, discussion in that task force just last week. Um, Part of the challenge that that conversation unearthed is that the issue of child care, it exists in a much broader context of the issue of early child development, okay? And so what we want to ensure that our child care task force doesn't try to run too far afield because it's a much broader issue. It's child care it, 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 or, or Early childhood development is a much broader issue than simply child care. And so what we're going to try to do is stay within the confines of how do we in Tennessee leverage and align all of our resources so that child care in Tennessee is safe, healthy, and affordable to the broadest population possible. Peter Lambert. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, and with that, and kind of circling back a bit here to the CCDF funding, the COVID relief fund specifically, at the end of this fiscal year, will we have, will we have expended all of those funds or will any of those be returned to the federal government? 
um, we, we will not have expended them all be, because the, um, the, the, the time to expend them all is not by the end of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. so, so it is our intention to expend all the funding before the expiration date, um, but, but it won't be by the end of this fiscal year. Later, Lambert. Thank you, Commissioner, and really just two follow-ups on that. Uh, one, I hope we're not only focused on, and as part of that task force, and, uh, and I appreciate the Chairman's leadership on that, that's been an important issue for her for years, but as part of that task force, I hope we're not just focusing on what I would call kind of preschool child care, um, but also following, following up on after-school programs. And so that's one of the things that I see missing in our community is that you have children that, you know, we get them into a K through 12 situation, and then many of them um, at a pretty young age are coming home to an empty home. So school buses dropping them off, they're coming in, mom and dad are still at work. And so there are several after-school programs that are out there already, but really beefing those up so that they are not just child care, but they really are following up on what we're doing with the school system that we heard from the Department of Education. So that's more of just a comment than a question. Okay. But my question is this. Um, I know that the department has indicated previously that there were a lot of challenges, just as all of our departments had, in getting uh, such a large sum of funds out to different child care providers in such a short time frame. So right. the federal money came in, it came in very rapidly, and it, was, it needed to be out there very rapidly. And I will tell you, I've, I've contacted your staff on multiple occasions. They've always done a fantastic job when I had specific providers. But there appears that there's kind of a systemic issue in our system on when you have individuals that are eligible for programs, matching them up with providers and just kind of processing those applications. And that seems like an issue that's been out there for years. How are we doing on that, on making sure that the folks that are eligible for the programs both know about the programs and then it's being implemented well so that the providers are actually being um, provided those funds on a, on a very timely basis? And, and, and so that, um, that issue is being tackled in the transformation of the DHS child care system. Um, you, you highlight uh, appropriately a, um, a very real and long-standing systemic problem. And, and, and so the department uh, uh, some a while back embarked upon a transformation of our entire child care system that literally works from the family that needs the child care all the way up through the providers that do it through the system so, so, so that not only are we seeking to make it safe, healthy, and affordable, but we also want to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and un unfortunately, we don't believe that the golden ticket approach is the way to solve the problem. In other words, what I mean by that is that an individual can reach out to someone of connection and say, I've got a problem and get it resolved that way. It needs to be resolved systemically. And that's what it is that we're trying to do with our transformation. Yep. Last question. Leader Lambert. Hey, Madam Chairman, and last question. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, I do hope that we keep um, enough people in the process where when there is an issue that folks can reach out and say, hey, there's Absolutely. an issue here, and you kind of do those one-offs. But I agree with you 100%, and I hope this is where you're headed, that there would be a system in place, because this is so flexible many times, where we have folks with this particular program that will, will, will need this for time periods in their life, and then not need any more. But when they need child care, it's everything. I mean, it, it sets up the entire paradigm for the rest of it. And, uh, and some of them are eligible, some of them are not. And for many of the providers, they operated, as you all know, oh, on some very, true. very thin margins. Absolutely. Um, and so even if we were to get weeks behind sometimes, I mean, it could be disastrous for some of those providers. So just keep that in mind as we're going through. And I know I've brought some of that up in the past. And uh, it seems like you guys are tackling those. And again, your staff's done a great job of, of responding to any of those. But systemically, I'm glad to know we're going right at that so that that will no longer be an issue. So thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I would just add to the Commissioner's comments about the Child Care Task Force. It's a huge issue. Uh, it's very complex. There's um, all sorts of pieces of it that we haven't even, uh, you know, scratched the surface on. Yep. There's a great need in our state for 24-7 child care. Right. Uh, finding child care from 8 to 5 is difficult enough. Finding child care on the weekends or after 5 o'clock is nearly impossible. But we have a lot of manufacturers in our state who run um, at two shifts, sometimes uh -huh. three. Yep. 
uh, if we're going to have people who are able to work those shifts, then they have children that we're going to have to be able to provide quality child care for. We have another issue in a lack of accessibility in terms of just providers, and not all providers accept subsidies um, right. from the state or federal government, so that means that there are some providers who are closed uh, to some families who need that child care. So, um, and again, we have a huge workforce issue in the state of Tennessee and across the country. We have a lot of people who are sitting out. Um, they're not a part of the workforce at this point. I contend that a significant number of those are not in the workforce because they cannot find adequate child care for their children. Exactly. You cannot go to work and just leave your children to fend for themselves. So um, it's, it's an issue that we need to address it's always been an issue, I think, the pandemic and all the things that have happened around it have just exacerbated it and also uh, kind of highlighted it and made the issue rise to the top in terms of um, some people's attention. So hopefully the task force is a public-private sector um, yep. group because this is something that government cannot solve. Uh, it has to be a partnership with the private sector. So there's a lot of work to be done, but hopefully we'll be, be making progress. Um, Thank you. Uh, next on my list, Representative Lynn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions about the SNAP program, but before I do, um, can I just say that the department did so well, in my, in my opinion, during the pandemic. I had so many constituents contacting me, and, um, you know, they had the child care issues. Um, they had the... Uh, the um, the COVID money for children uh, for food, uh, that program, um, so many things like that, and they were just never disappointed. They were just so grateful for the assistance that they received. You know, these were largely people who they their employer required them to work during the pandemic. They could not work at home, right. and so they wanted someplace safe. Uh, for their child, and um, they, thanks to the state of Tennessee, they were able to do that, and thanks to all the work of your department. So I'm I'm really grateful um, for that. I heard time and time again from people, and I was able to make them aware of these programs, and boy, were they grateful. So thank you so much um, for all that hard work. I, I know, boy, it was it was a lot of hard work. <laughs> I know it was a lot. Um, I, I so I just wanted to extend my thanks for my district and the people who live in my district. And, and if I if I could respond just briefly, yes. Um, as as you know, um, I landed here in the middle of the pandemic, and um, w was most pleased that I came into a place with a highly experienced and competent labor force. Mm -hmm. That um, that they made sure that the. Um, that, that the points that you're making, they made sure that our system took care of those. So I, 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 I you know, I didn't have to come in and, and re rebuild this place. I just had to um, find my find my way in it. So that I, I will share that acknowledgement with our, with our highly competent DHS labor. Please force. do. Just mm -hmm. let them know that the 57th district is extremely Excellent. grateful for all of their hard work. And I'll tell you, there was just nobody who had a, a complaint about. Um, anything in your department, they were just very grateful for the assistance. So Excellent. it was a hard, hard, difficult time. Um, but let me ask you, in regard to the SNAP program, beyond, and I, and I realize how hard it is to reach out to people and make them aware of these programs. Um, you know, we send out emails to our constituents, but we don't email everybody. We also um, write on Facebook, but we don't reach everybody, even in our district. Many people aren't on social media. So <clears throat> given those constraints of how difficult it is to reach people, how difficult is, um, or what has the department done beyond social media to ensure that the information is reaching all SNAP eligible families? How do you, how do, you do that? So um, a a as I um, re responded to um, I a previous question, one of the most important uh, partnerships DHS has is with literally hundreds of community providers, mm -hmm. community-based organizations 
that understand that community instinctively and they know where the need is. And so we rely on them sure. to ensure that the community understands what's, uh, uh, what, what's available in order to be able to use. You know, one of the problems that, um, that, that our public support systems has created um, inadvertently over the course of you know, the past 60 years as we have moved towards a more government-centric system is that we have crowded out other parts of our community from solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there's this notion <coughs> that somehow government is the principal problem solver. And so what we have to do, quite frankly, is get over the arrogance of government to believe that it is the problem solver yeah. and engage all of Tennessee in trying to solve the in trying to solve the problems that we have. So we use our community providers to, to let folks know what's available. Thank you. And I, I have one more question, Madam Chairman, if that's okay. Um, in in uh, the department's estimation, what percent of SNAP eligible people have taken advantage of the additional SNAP allotments? Okay, so so um, again, I'm not giving you a time period, so I'm sorry. No, no it's no, it's, it's fine. No, uh, again, the the additional SNAP allotment, it it didn't expand of it, um, eligibility. So in other words, there were not um, individuals and families that were covered that, that weren't covered previously, that this additional funding would have served. It increased the level of benefit for those that were already in the system. So, 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 so everyone who was eligible for those increases received them, uh, but, but, but there was not new eligibility created out of any of those authorizations. And if I could add to that, I just looked it up while we were sitting here. There's 831,000 individuals who are on SNAP. So um, that many individuals would have received that extra amount of money throughout the entire pandemic. And I would hope that there was the ongoing process that's already in place to add people to SNAP uh, as people lost jobs or, or whatever. So um, I just want to make it clear that that pool was not limited to just those who were in it at the beginning Absolutely. of the pandemic. Those who became eligible during also that's received correct. those benefits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Hicks, you're next. Thank you, Chair Lady Commissioner. Thank you for being here. It's always fun seeing how long it takes you to find this. So uh, <laughs> thank you for being here, you and your staff. My question deals with the uh, with the PEBT cards. I know back when, I guess it was that March time frame, that first round, a little confusing on uh, how that program was implemented. Yes. Uh, bounce back strong in round two, I'll say that. Some people we're still a little bit confused on, okay, am I going to get these payments directly? Am I going to get them through my school? Uh, how, how, where are they going to show up? Right. They were very happy they showed up, but it was still a little confusing, but Absolutely. I think that got ironed out slowly. But with that confusion, how many of those cards actually got sent back to the federal government? How many did we actually use, and how well was this program utilized? So um, let, let me just take a half step back and, and, and run forward. So, so part of... The, the, the challenge in the early days of PEBT was that it created a new partnership between DHS and our Department of Education. A and the nature of that partnership is that those children that were eligible for free and reduced lunch, they were the ones that would be eligible for this pandemic EBT program. Well, so, so we have not previously had a relationship with the Department of Education around program eligibility. And that wasn't something that DHS had the ability to do. So we had to forge this relationship with the Department of Education around who would be eligible to receive. So that was um, challenge one. Challenge two is that for each round of PEBT, for some ridiculous reason, the federal government changed the rules, okay? And so somebody that was eligible in round one wasn't eligible in round two, okay? 
Uh, um, and, and so we had to sort of chase the bouncing ball, and that was us and DOE had to chase the bouncing ball of who is eligible to, 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 receive, this, uh, to receive this. So then finally, to, the, to answer your question, I will need to get you an exact number of the number of cards re, uh, returned, but, um, but, but we served more than 700,000 children um, over the course of the three, the three tranches of PEBT. And we will, we will, we will get you um, as best a number as we can on the number of those cards that were returned. And Commissioner, if I could follow Please. up, um, those benefits have not expired. Right. So we are not sending the PEBT money back to the federal government. If we can find that person and their address and know that they're eligible, we can still send them that benefit. So when we follow up um, with just how many that is still left from the first round, um, just know that we, that benefit is still available to those families. So, Ms. Page, help me right there. So are you guys still working with the Department of Education? Are you working with school districts directly? What does that look like at this point to try to find these, these kiddos? This so so we, we continue to work with both, both okay. the school districts and DOE. Okay. okay, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair Lady. Oh, <laughs> thank you for that, Madam Chair Lady. Now I may have to explain it, which I'm not going to. Right. Thank you all for being here. We, um, we appreciate that. Um, in April of 2020, the adult, to kind of give you a little bit of background of my question, the Audit of the Child and Adult Food Program found that there may have been some broad risk in payments for meals that weren't served. So my, my question is, how has the department monitored requirements and provided oversight to ensure that fraud and waste are not occurring through these COVID relief funded programs and the department's use of funds is fully compliant with the federal requirements. Um, and, 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 and so again, I want to, I want to, um, step back out a little bit and then come into your, um, your question. One of the things that was very clear to me early on as the federal money began to move in all of these support programs is that there was going to be geometrically more available and the emphasis was going to be on getting the money out the door and serving folks and less of an emphasis on the accountability for it. But what I said to our team is, there is going to be a day of reckoning when folks are gonna ask the question, what'd you do with it, okay? And at that time, nobody's gonna remember that we were in the middle of a pandemic and told, get it out the door, okay? That being said, what we have done in DHS is um, empowered our Office of Inspector General to join arms with our programs to ensure that we can do this as efficiently and effectively as possible. And we brought the, the Office of the Comptroller into, the, um, into that discussion. Now, I will tell you that Literally, by the federal design of the food, the feeding pro, those feeding programs, there, there is built-in operational challenges, which we have been trying to raise with the federal government for years. The Department of Human Services has been trying to raise for years. What it is our belief is that the, the, the pandemic will enable us to redouble our efforts and, and, and the comptroller's office is committed to us going jointly to the Department of Agriculture and sharing with them that we, 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 we want to have this responsibility to make this vital support available, but you could certainly help us with some of your, some of your rules and guidelines to be able to, to allow us to make that delivery more efficient to be able to have better accountability on the front end. We have found that some of our more mom and pop service providers literally don't have the capacity to do this work, but yet the emphasis has been on use everybody that you can to just move the meals. And so we need to balance that some up front. We wanna be able to, to, to have an accountability mechanism up front that says yes, it is important for us to move this vital resource to the community, but we need to make sure that th that entity that's doing it on, on our behalf 
literally has the operational capacity to do so. So, so, so um, between working, w uh, joining our program in our Office of Inspector General's Office, along with the Comptroller, and taking a joint approach to the federal government, and then building in some other accountability mechanisms on the front end, that's how we hope to address fraud, waste, and abuse in the feeding programs. Thank you very much. I appreciate that explanation. Thank you. Chairman Faison. Thank you, Chair Lady Hazelwood. Commissioner, good to see you. Good to see you, sir. So one of the things I learned from Dr. Bob Ramsey, he's not here so we can say his name, we don't have to worry about him talking, <laughs> is, the, is the importance of dental hygiene. It's vitally important. I've spent a lot of time in Africa, and we always take dentists with us because there's so much that takes place in your body from having bad hygiene in your mouth. Absolutely. And I know that we have this uh, the block grant for the dental programs, and uh, I, I'm from the Appalachians. We obviously it's it's something vitally important to us over in the Appalachians, and I just wondered, could you speak to where we're at? How are we doing uh, with making sure we're providing the services? from what we've been provided with the dental block grant. Could you just speak to it and kind of tell us how we're doing in Tennessee with it? So, so um, it is through the community services block grant that we then pass through funding to the network of 21 community action agencies um, in, in Tennessee. And those community action agencies then deliver um, all kinds of relevant services to, to those communities. And so um, on the, um, from the dental perspective, we, 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 we move those dollars from the community services block grant to the community action agencies who are actually either delivering or contracting to deliver the dental services to the community. Chairman Faison. Thank you, that's all I had. Representative Sparks. Thank you. Commissioner, just want to compliment you. I know your, um, well, your staff, Marcy, really bragged uh, on you the other day. And uh, I mean, it, I thought you could walk on water the way she talked. Um, but I appreciate your passion. You know, that's what we need up here is passion to, to make a difference in folks' lives. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tennessee Rehabilitation Center in Smyrna. I am. Okay, yes, it's sir. my district. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, to go back with uh, the chair lady, um, Hazelwood had mentioned about workforce development. I think this committee has heard me talk about a, about a man that was mentally challenged. Uh, I think he was, my understanding of his birth, he um, was without oxygen for so long and had a severe brain injury. Sadly, that, that man passed away last month. I was at his funeral a few weeks ago, died with COVID. Um, he went through Tennessee Rehab Rehabilitation Center and the thing that's interesting about this guy, this is what I want this committee to understand. Because a lot of folks, I think, look and say, man, there's no hope for that person. You can't do nothing for that person. That's right. You can't work that person. This guy has bowled a perfect game bowling. I'll be damned. Perfect game. Um, 17, 17 strikes in a row. Wow. And um, he had all these gold medals, Special Olympics. And, they, and his brother said that he was, like, about to qualify for the professional bowlers tournament. I was like, man, this is really wow. – Strange, uh, but he went through that program, and it's an awesome program. Um, and um, uh, my assistant's trying to call them to see if you could be the next commencement speaker over there when they graduate. It's we'll very moving. So. I want to encourage all my lawmakers if they're listening right now. I don't know if they're all listening, but um, but I want them to all to, to be able to attend uh, one of them graduations because uh, it's it's tear jerking. Because, you know, we look back and we think, man, I got problems. I got a family member with problems. And then you see folks like that that's, like, on fire to go to work, yep. whether it's McDonald's, whether it's a car dealership, whether it's Home Depot, right. you know, whether it's Publix or Kroger. Some of those companies will take the time. Walgreens take time to give them a job. CVS is really involved. But anyways, I just um, look forward to seeing you as the commencement address speaker if you can if you can make it. Um, my assistant's trying to get a hold of them now. He, I don't know if he's had any luck, but we, we, we will love to see you there. We will certainly get that worked out. And, and, and um, I issues like this, and I'm going to apologize in advance, get me a little wound up. Okay. Um, we, we have 
in, in this country created a construct where we want to try to protect some people from life. That we say that somehow you are too broken, you're too fragile, you, you've had too many challenges in order to be able to make your life work. I would say that is not only the height of, her of arrogance, okay, who are we to determine somebody else's life fate? And so we create a program construct that says you don't have to. It's okay, you don't have to. Well, well we, we, we believe pretty differently in the Department of Human Services. We believe that everybody is capable, everybody. And it becomes our objective as society to be able to adjust to their needs, become program centric, to be able to enable everybody to be able to make their way. We don't do anybody any favors by saying you can opt out of life's race, okay? We only do them a favor when we enable them to do so. And so you will hear me talking about in DHS this notion of growing capacity to reduce dependency. Um, and, and what I so like about our vocational rehabilitation and our TRCs is that they are built around the perspective of that person can. It's built around their ability, okay? And then our objective to use the tools to help them achieve their objectives. So it would be my honor and privilege to speak at the next, uh, at the next graduation. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, obviously, as the uh, representative noted, you are passionate and um, that's, that's great and it's to the benefit of Tennesseans. Chairman Hawk, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Commissioner Carter, thank you uh, for the quick friendship we've made. My 10-year-old thinks you hung the moon, so she, <laughs> she thinks you're pretty cool. I'm, I've been waiting 40 minutes for you to, to get those words out, grow capacity and reduce dependency, so I'm glad you're able to get that out. We've done some, um, some really good work jointly yep. uh, and a legislative administrative work on the TANF program and the TANF Opportunity Act to work with Families First. And I think it's critically important that, that we keep our eyes on that, that, that how important your department is to workforce development as we partner with Department of Labor, Department of Health, Department of Education, all these, you know, all these departments along with Department of Human Services yep. who are going to help us create and expand and give us that rich workforce that we need to to handle the jobs in the future and, and I just want you to talk a little bit about the uh, the opportunity to reduce uh, dependency and help these families grow in their capacity as they go forward Ch chairman Hawk thanks so much for the opportunity and um, if you think it was over top on the last one uh, uh, um, we have a tremendous opportunity here in Tennessee to showcase this notion of, and I'll go back to the term, growing capacity to reduce dependency. And it begins with our intention to do so, okay? Um, we, 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 we have been, our system has, I'm sorry, has, has focused on the delivery of benefits, goods, and services, not helping people get to the place in their life where they don't need those benefits, goods, and services. And so we will have seven pilots, two in each of the three grand divisions and one that's operated by DHS, where we are going to test this notion of what does that look like on the ground? What does it look like when you bring together the community of faith, the private sector, academia, non-government organizations together in a whole of Tennessee approach, which is based on growing people beyond the vulnerabilities for which they need um, these, uh, uh, these benefits, goods, and services. Um, and, and, and so what I would ask uh, of, of this group is to please pay attention as this unfolds. We are in the process now of uh, making determinations on a number of planning grants. And so on the 7th of December, that uh, Families First Advisory Council will come together and we will make uh, determinations. We have 49 applications um, from all across Tennessee 
and we will provide planning grants to a number of those entities where what we're saying to them is build out your construct. We like what you said in the beginning. Tell us more about it. How's it going to operate? Uh, um, who are your partners? Uh, uh, th those kinds of things. And then we will use that information to actually determine um, six of those seven pilots. And so what is most important about that objective is that we don't believe that the system of public supports should be an end for anyone. It is not that we don't choose to serve. It is that we don't want any Tennessean who we can help to run their race have to live a life of the meager subsistence of public supports. And so we begin with the intention of growing capacity to reduce dependency. And, and we believe that the, the, the system of public supports should be a mile marker in a life's journey, not a destination unto itself. That's what we hope to prove through the TANF program, Opportunity Act. I think that's what we'd all like to um, see, Commissioner. There are, all of us has faced tough times and we will face tough times in the future, so we certainly need safety net, but right. What we want to do is provide a safety net and then a ladder for people to climb out and, yes, um, and be self-sufficient. So um, thank you for your work in, in making that happen. Are there other questions for the commissioner or staff? Well, commissioner, it seems that you've done um, a great job. We will look forward, and I, I will mention that the questionnaire that was referenced a couple of times, it is in your material. It is on your dashboard, so you can see the questions and their full responses uh, from the department. At, you can look at those at your leisure. We will be looking forward uh, when we're next together with budget hearings to hear specifically um, how funds are going to be extended in the upcoming budget year, including the federal dollars as well as, as the state dollars that would, I guess, normally, whatever, however you define normal these days, uh, would be spent. So um, thank you for sharing your time with us today and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, again during regular session thank you <laughs> all right because we have done such a marvelous job of staying on task and on time i'm going to reward you with a long lunch break please plan to be back at two o'clock and we will stand in recess until 2, at which time we will be hearing from um, the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. Thank you.